them on lean. <laughs> Turned out to be kind of awkward. What? I felt bad for you. Oh, no, no. She totally skirted you. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> You're fine. You were like in one direction. You're yeah, yeah. In it's the like other. some sort of like comi comedy. I know. Yeah, because so. yeah, I literally came down here first just to find out where she should go. I probably should have just gone there. Well, and right after you left, Kirsten Mitchell from my office called and said, Well, by the way, you know, Del Powell is here. I said, A marina's on her way. Yeah. And then while we're talking, yeah. she's daring to come down. Oh, yeah. She's fine. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us at the National Archives today to celebrate Sunshine Week 2019. I am Alina Simo, the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, the Federal FOIA Ombudsman, part of the National Archives and Records Administration. This is my third opportunity to serve as MC of the Sunshine Week event in this wonderful uh, William G. McCowan Theater. I'm not sure if I've been doing a good job, but I just keep inviting myself back. It seems to be working. 
We're happy to be joined by many of you in person today. Thank you for coming. And we also welcome all of those who are watching the live webcast. And we have put together a very exciting afternoon. I'm particularly pleased that we have been able to bring together representatives from all three branches of government, judicial, legislative, and executive. This year, in addition to our celebration of open government and transparency, I am excited that we are celebrating a bit early the 10-year anniversary of OGIS. 10 years ago, in the fall of 2009, OGIS first opened its doors to help FOIA requesters and agencies navigate the FOIA process and help improve it along the way. So I looked on the internet to see what the 10th anniversary gift is. Tin was the answer that came up the most often. Um, tin, I learned, represents flexibility and durability. I thought those were two particularly apt words to describe OGIS. The other thing I learned is that the modern 10-year anniversary gift is diamond jewelry. <laughs> I like the sound of that so much more. <laughs> to make sure we have a time for all of our great speakers today, we have on our agenda, I'm going to move into my introduction of the Archivist of the United States, who will welcome you and officially kick off our program today. David Ferriero was confirmed as the 10th Archivist of the United States on November 6, 2009. Prior to his confirmation as archivist, David served as the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the New York Public Libraries and held top positions at two of the nation's major academic libraries, the Massachusetts Institutes of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. He earned his Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts degrees in English Literature for Northeastern University in Boston and a Master of Arts degree from the Simmons College of Library and Information Science, also in Boston. Since early in his tenure, David has committed the National Archives to the principles of open government, transparency, participation, and collaboration, which are the very values we are celebrating today. David has also been a constant supporter of OGIS and the work that we do, and we are very grateful for his sustained support and leadership. Please join me in welcoming the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, to the stage to begin today's program. So good afternoon and welcome to my house. It's nice to have you with us, um, whether you're here physically in the building or watching us um, virtually. So Sunshine Week, you know, is a national initiative um, created by the American Society of News Editors to bring attention to the importance of access to public records in our democracy. And I can't think of a better place to be celebrating Sunshine Week than here at the National Archives because we not only contribute but serve as a leader in open government. As a nation's record keeper, our holdings span our great nation's history and capture its experiences and soul. Among the 15 billion textual records and 43 million photographs, many already online with more available digitally every day, are the Oaths of Allegiance signed by George Washington and his troops at Valley Forge, the Emancipation Proclamation, records pertaining to American prisoners of war and missing in action from the Vietnam War era, as well as the tweets that are being created as I am speaking in the White House. And of course, our cherished charters of freedom, the founding documents of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights displayed upstairs in the rotunda. Our employees work hard, making at, hard at making access happen during Sunshine Week, as well as the other 51 weeks of the year, Make Access Happen, in fact, is one of NARA's four strategic goals and the topic of much of what will be discussed this afternoon. We have an interesting and thought-provoking program for you today, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome representatives from all three branches of our government. Chief Judge Beryl Howell of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia has graciously agreed to join me in a conversation and you all are invited to eavesdrop. And Senator John Cornyn of Texas and Patrick Leahy of Vermont live on opposite sides of the political fence, but like good neighbors, come together every now and then. Despite their political differences, they both champion FOIA and have worked across the aisle to improve the statute and FOIA administration. Senator Cornyn will join us momentarily and Senator Leahy will join us later this afternoon. Today's program has been organized by NARA's Office of Government Information Services, the Freedom of Information Act Ombudsman. And later this year, as Alina mentioned, 
OGIS will be celebrating its 10th anniversary. In the last decade, the office has done much to help improve the administration of FOIA by assisting requesters in more than 15,000 cases, collaborating with agencies to comply with FOIA, and recommending improvements to the administration of FOIA. I'm particularly pleased to welcome back OGIS's first director, Miriam Nisbet, who will join OGIS current director, Alina Simo, and representatives from the legislative and judicial branches for a look at the ombudsman past, present, and future. We'll also be looking into the future of electronic record keeping with Crow, uh, our chief records officer, Lawrence Brewer, and a panel of experts who will share their insights into records management, which is at the heart of what we do here at the National Archives. We're particularly proud of our work at modernizing records management guidance proper records management is vital to both the success of our mission to provide public access to our holdings and to the success of agencies in fulfilling their duties under the Freedom of Information Act. A few words now about Senator John Cornyn of Texas. Before being elected to the U.S. Senate in 2002, Senator Cornyn had a long and distinguished career as a judge, a champion of public records. He served as a Texas District Judge and Associate Justice of the Texas Supreme Court and as Texas Attorney General. During his three years as Texas Attorney General, the office relaunched open records enforcement after a period of dormancy and established a, a toll-free open records hotline. It also issued more than 20,000 informal letters in response to questions from Texas government officials and citizens. Among information he ruled must be released to the public cost reports submitted to the Texas Department of Human Services by nursing facilities with Medicaid contracts and a computer-generated map, map of the port of Corpus Christi. Since his election to the U.S. Senate, Senator Cornyn co-sponsored with Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont FOIA amendments that in 2007 presented a contrast to the adverse, adversarial process of litigation by introducing dispute resolution to the FOIA process. The open, openness promotes effectiveness in National Government, Open Government Act of 20, oh, 20, 2007 created OGIS, which opened its doors here at the National Archives in 2009. Senator Cornyn and Leahy joined forces again to co-sponsor the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016, which firmly wove dispute resolution into the fabric of the FOIA process creating multiple opportunities for requesters to seek assistance from both agency FOIA professionals and OGIS. So with that, let me uh, please join me in welcoming Senator John Cornyn to the podium. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, David, for that uh, that introduction, and it's good to be with all of you celebrating Sunshine Week. I want to thank uh, Alina Simo for, and everybody else at OGIS for uh, working so hard to organize today's event, and of course, everybody here with the National Archives. It's remarkable to me every time I'm here to consider the history that lives within these walls, uh, but also the challenges it's gonna, that faces uh, current and future archivists when it comes to just the different ways we communicate now these days than we ever have before. Um, and uh, look forward to, forward to the National Archives um, of uh, Twitter accounts uh, from the current and future presidents. Of course, the founding documents um, that uh, are here that millions of Americans come to see each year and those that declared our independence as a nation, those that defined the framework of our government and those that guarantee the rights of every person in this country. There are also the stories of countless brave Americans. If it weren't for a generation of uh, dedicated archivists, um, those stories would have been would have been lost. There are photos, of course, of America's greatest generation preparing to go to battle, which remind us all of the sacrifices of the men and women who serve our nation in uniform uh, to preserve our very freedoms that we celebrate even today. This building signifies an idea that we hold dearly as Americans, that this is our nation and our history, 
and you can't separate the two. These valuable documents and stories don't belong to any one person. They belong to all of us. Winston Churchill, for example, once said, the Declaration of Independence is not only an American document. So not only do these documents not belong only to us or to the archives, they belong to the world. They're just part of our memory, our collective memory as a nation, and part of the fabric that binds us together. That principle doesn't just apply to documents of historical significance, but to everyday functions of government as well, because you can never tell when those everyday functions of government will gain historical significance. Essential to safeguarding our right to access information is, of course, the Freedom of Information Act. Not only does it keep citizens in the know, but it also helps government accountable. The Freedom of Information Act serves not as a weapon, but as a shield, protecting the American people from a government when it abuses power or attempts to conceal wrongdoing. Since FOIA was first enacted, we've seen a uh, now familiar tug of war during both Democratic and Republican administrations, with some favoring more openness and others favoring less. As Senator Leahy, who I'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment and who you've heard is sort of, he and I are the odd couple uh, on FOIA, um, has said, it's a, of course, politicians are used to trumpeting our successes and we're less enthusiastic about trumpeting our failures. Thus, the importance of the Freedom of Information Act so that the full record and complete record can be disclosed uh, to the American people and people with the right to know. Of course, we can't allow the balance to tilt away from transparency. Each of us, of us in this room continue to fight for a government that views sharing information as a responsibility, not a burden. That really represents a culture change here in Washington, D.C. When I came from Texas, uh, I was familiar with a system that presumed a government record was open unless proven uh, to the contrary. Here in, uh, here in Washington, it seemed to me that, uh, that too many government agencies considered this information theirs, and they would fight long and hard to prevent anybody from getting access to the information. And given the non-presumption of openness, which fortunately we were able to change, it made it much easier to, uh, to, to not disclose that information or produce that record. I've always been proud of my state for having one of the strongest and most robust freedom of information laws in the country. And so when I came to Washington, having been Attorney General of Texas and having to enforce those laws, I wanted to bring that same sense of openness here to the national level as well. During my time in the Senate, I made government transparency a priority and press for more openness in federal government through legislation. As I said, uh, and as David mentioned, over the last decade or so, I've worked with my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Leahy, who I know you'll be hearing more from this afternoon, on a number of bills to improve government transparency. As we have, as I alluded a moment ago, I'll say it again, this is not a partisan issue, which is why you have a conservative Republican and a liberal Democrat finding common cause on this issue. A transparent government is vital to self-government. How can we govern ourselves unless we have the basic information of what government is doing and not doing so we can ask for correction or even uh, replace the officials who are administering uh, the laws or passing those laws? My bipartisan efforts with Senator Leahy began with the Open Government Act about a decade ago. Not only did this include major reforms to FOIA, it also established the Office of, office of Government Information Services. Building an office from the ground up is no, was no small task. I, I'm confident, I know that, especially one charged with a mission as broad and as critical as resolving disputes between FOIA requesters and government agencies. My interest in helping to establish this office and this function really grew out of my role, again, as Attorney General back in the state, where frequently you had people requesting documents um, that were unnecessarily overbroad, or maybe they were requesting documents which weren't really what they were trying to get at. 
So having some intermediary uh, trying to work with the requester and the responding agency uh, was very efficient and effective in getting not only getting the uh, citizen the documents that they wanted, um, but also saving a lot of time and effort and even litigation expenses. Thinking back to the vision that we had for OGIS more than a decade ago, it's remarkable that uh, this year the office will celebrate its 10th anniversary. In the 2019 annual report to Congress that was just released, I was amazed to see that since OGIS opened its doors, it has responded to more than 15,000 requests for assistance, with nearly a third of those happening last fiscal year alone. Since the years, in the years since OGIS was stood up, its small but mighty team has done a tremendous amount of work to strengthen FOIA policies throughout the government. In 2018, OGIS released its first advisory opinion, just one example of how the office continues to improve and refine its role. I have no doubt that in the coming years, its impact will continue to grow as departments and agencies be begin to rely more heavily on the valuable services that it provides. Since the passage of the Open Government Act, Senator Leahy and I have worked together on a number of other bills and initiatives, big and small, to ensure that government openness is strengthened. The most significant, I believe, is the FOIA Improvement Act, which became law in 2016. This required federal agencies to operate under that presumption of openness that I mentioned a moment ago, which I believe is so important when considering whether or not to release government information. It also aimed to reduce the overuse of exemptions to withhold information from the public and minimize the bureaucracy that a FOIA, request, a FOIA requester would have to navigate by requiring the creation of a single portal through which individuals can submit a request to any agency. On top of that, this legislation required agencies proactively to disclose documents that are likely to be of public interest in order to increase access to government documents outside the often onerous FOIA request process. In other words, it built upon what our founding fathers recognized hundreds of years ago, that a truly democratic system depends on an informed citizenry to hold their leaders accountable, their government leaders accountable. And while this was a big step in improving government accountability, there's more work to be done, to be sure. And I look for new opportunities to work to improve the FOIA process and to ensure that it remains robust. Just last week, I joined with a number of my colleagues in a letter to Acting Interior Secretary David Bernhardt regarding proposed changes to that department's FOIA procedures. These changes would restrict access to the department's records and make the process more confusing and it's complicated for individuals submitting requests and would be a step backwards in our overall efforts. We all are familiar with Justice Brandeis's famous axiom that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Well, it was true then and it's still true today. And that's why Congress has and will continue to enact legislation that promotes accountability and transparency in the government so that good leadership and good governance can flourish. I want to thank you all for the important work you do year-round to bring this issue out of the shadows and into the sunlight. And I, for one, will continue to work with anybody to help advocate policies in the Senate that will build for a more transparent government. And I encourage you to share your thoughts with us about how we can do just that. I hope this Sunshine Week we can all grow even more committed to the mission of open government that serves its people and not itself. Thank you for having me. Thank you again, Senator Cornyn, for your remarks today. Um, we're very grateful that he was able to come and join us and uh, share his insights about FOIA and open government. Uh, so to continue today's celebration of open government, I am excited to introduce the next event on our agenda. It is uh, my great pleasure to introduce to all of you Beryl Howell, the Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, 
who will be conversing with the archivist on a variety of topics today related to open government, transparency, and the legal landscape. Judge Howell received her BA with honors in philosophy from Bryn Mawr College and her JD from Columbia University School of Law, where she was a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar. She was appointed to the district court bench in 2010. But before joining the judiciary, Judge Howell had a long and distinguished career in the other two branches of government. In the executive branch as a federal criminal prosecutor, having served as deputy chief of the narcotics section and an assistant United States attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, and in the legislative branch as staff and later general counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Her perspective of open government from the vantage point of having served in all three branches of government will no doubt inform today's conversation. Please join me in welcoming Chief Judge Howe and the archivist. Which seat do you want? I'm going to sit here. Totally unrehearsed. <laughs> unstaged. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Yes, well thank you for having me. So we have, um, we have a set of questions that, that the, the judge has uh, agreed to talk about with us. Um, but one that, that you didn't review that I'm going to start with is why did you accept our invitation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well that's, that's an easy softball. Um, because I think it's um, incredibly appropriate to be celebrating Sunshine Week uh, and the Freedom of Information Act, which is, has its goal to the, the disclosure of uh, government information at a place that's responsible for preserving it. So perhaps someday it might be disclosed if it hasn't been already. So I thought it was very fitting to start Sunshine Week here. And we appreciate you doing that for us. So you've, um, as Alina cited, you've had experience in all three branches of our government. And what has that experience, how has that experience influenced um, what you do today? Well, I saw my first FOIA request on the receiving end of one uh, when I was a federal prosecutor in a very busy prosecutor office. And my mission was to investigate and prosecute crimes, but I had to stop what I was doing in order to respond to some FOIA requests. And I can't say that I had the best attitude <laughs> about that. Uh -huh. um, but I have to say that I think my attitude about the FOIA evolved over time. Uh, and so that I understood that um, in every government official, no matter what the primary mission might be, you had a dual mission. And the dual mission was to provide uh, responses to FOIA requests because sunshine uh, and revealing and disclosing appropriately uh, government records under the FOIA uh, provides the transparency that engenders confidence in government functions. Um, so that was, uh, that was the beginning of the evolution of my thinking about the FOIA, which continued to evolve. And I learned a lot from my boss on the Hill, Patrick Leahy who has always been, as Senator Cornyn said, one of the big boosters of the Freedom of Information Act and all that it means uh, as a bulwark in our democracy. Um, and one of the first tasks he gave to me when I joined his staff uh, was to help get passage of the electronic FOIA amendments of 1996. And through that process, I spent a lot of time talking to the FOIA requester community uh, journalists, um, and also uh, agency officials who were responsible for responding to those FOIA, requ FOIA requests and understanding what some of the problems were in processing and the improvements that were needed in the electronic FOIA amendments. And I see some people in the audience who I worked with all those many, many years ago. Um, and so I think that um, it's certainly true of the, of the Freedom of Information Act that once you understand its importance, you stick with it for years and years. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it's always nice to come to FOIA events because I never fail to see people I've known from decades past. Um, I think um, in my work both responding to the FOIA as a, as a federal prosecutor, uh, working on the policy arena on the Hill with the FOIA, I think all of those experiences have helped inform what I do as a judge. 
where um, as a judge I'm not looking at broader policy or oversight issues on the FOIA, but I am looking at specific requests and my job is to uh, ensure that the agency is conducting adequate searches um, and applying the FOIA uh, and the FOIA requirements uh, reasonably, and, and I, we do that as judges typically in FOIA cases mm -hmm. by examining um, the specificity, the, the, the reasoning um, and uh, declarations provided by uh, FOIA personnel um, in order to assess how well they've complied with the FOIA, FOIA requirements. So it's a different task. So you, um, you raised this, um, so I, I'm gonna follow up on it, even though we didn't talk about this. Um, but you have a lot of people here who are involved in FOIA from a lot of different um, aspects, and you, you raised the issue of attitude. What advice would you give these folks um, in terms of helping people develop the attitude? Well, I do think that um, FOIA officers within agencies, you know, have a, you know, have a task of um, talking to all of the agency personnel that they must go to uh, to help conduct the searches and retrieve documents that ha then have to be reviewed by the FOIA personnel. I do think that uh, FOIA officers and personnel within every agency are the unsung heroes of the Freedom of Information Act. They have a hard job. Um, they've got to uh, pound down doors, chase down people, to get them to help them, the FOIA officers, respond to FOIA requests. Um, and they aren't told thank you very much uh, by certainly from people within the agency. Um, they need to have the support of the leadership within each agency uh, because um, uh, that sets the tone at the top about the importance of open government um, and the transparency that uh, FOIA is one tool uh, to, uh, you know, provide that transparency. And the other one is uh, good records management. Certainly good <laughs> records management. Which is the backbone uh, which, uh, of open government. Of, of course, of course. <laughs> we haven't said that recently, but that's... <laughs> How do you see your current role as chief judge of this court? Of the district court in the District of Columbia? Um, well, um, you know, being chief uh, sounds fancy and great, um, but um, being chief doesn't mean that I can issue orders in anything other than my individual cases. I cannot order my uh, colleagues around. And in fact, it's one of those um, fundamental virtues of our federal judiciary that chief judges have zero power over their colleagues. It seems to bother you though. No, not at all, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Um, I think um, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's really important that every judge on my court is an independent Article III judge, makes his or her decisions, uh, and it, there, it isn't there, I have no ability to punish them or do anything to them when they're exercising their own decision. But really, chief judges do have administrative and statutory duties within each court. Um, I view myself as sort of the chairman of the board or the chief operating officer where the components of the court, um, including the clerk's office, uh, the probation office, the court reporters, uh, generally report to me. Um, and it is one of the delights of being the chief judge that I get to work with these highly skilled, uh, committed, dedicated uh, judiciary staff uh, within the, the, each court. Um, you know, and, and making sure that the um, court works efficiently uh, and is welcoming to the public uh, and uh, in, in, providing, in providing justice. As chief, I, I think, um, since we're talking about transparency, um, I, I have to say that one of the things that I have tried to do is promote some additional transparency um, in, in the court. Um, to the extent that I do have some uh, powers to do so as the chief judge. Uh, one way, for example, is um, there are a lot of customary practices within the court that aren't reflected transparently in our rules of practice. 
Um, and I've spent a lot of time as, in my three years as chief judge updating our rules so that people uh, know some of my duties and some of the things that if it's filed in court that it will come to me or, or be randomly assigned um, so that it's, that's more transparent. Um, another thing that I'm actually uh, quite proud of um, is every court in the country has very significant um, sealed dockets. Uh, they're sealed for good reason because they involve um, largely government surveillance applications and ongoing criminal investigations. But then once the criminal investigation is done, those sealed dockets remain sealed. Um, and working with the US Attorney's Office and our clerk's office, uh, we were able to come up with a system whereby every six months we disclose limited docket information about all of the sealed applications in DC. I've gone back about 10 years at this point. Um, and um, I think that that's where the first court in the country to do it the way we're doing it. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm very proud of that initiative. The docket information, um, one of the things we, I did working with the US Attorney's Office and components at the Department of Justice, which has also been a partner in this effort, um, is to work out uh, uniform templates for the applications so that there is a lot of information embedded in the caption mm -hmm. about uh, the offense under investigation, the specific surveillance tool or um, statutory authority that's being invoked, uh, f uh, and the target, the number of email addresses, for example, or mobile phones or that kind of thing that are the subject matter of the surveillance application, which is all embedded in the template and so in those lists that we're producing of the sealed dockets people can get a sense of what is the judiciary doing in terms of numbers and types of investigations um, that make up our, our sealed docket and where are those uh, they're available on our website which is uh, I mind. don't know <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't I actually okay. know our, right. our website address, but, but you just are, look up district court for the District of Columbia Very and you can, you, can, you can find it. Use Google. <laughs> no advertisements, please. <laughs> but you also get to do naturalization ceremony. You didn't mention yes, that. Yes, yes. Well, that's usually when I'm here at the National that's Archives. Right. I'm, I'm usually here to swear in new citizens in the rotunda, and it's one of the more magical, amazing experiences I get to have as chief judge. So say a few words. That is one of the, a lot of people don't know this. This is something I learned when I was chief judge, um, that, that um, uh, presiding over naturalization ceremonies and naturalizing uh, new US citizens is something that district judges are allowed to do, but not circuit judges. For circuit judges to be able to do that, we have to get them designated as a district court judge. So it's a, it's a fairly complicated process and that's, I don't know whether it was an oversight in the statute that they did that. <laughs> and just designated district court judges or not. Sort of an interesting fun fact. So say a few words about the value of an independent judiciary. Well, you don't have to say very much about the value of an independent judiciary. I think simply put, it is to enforce and uphold the rule of law that has repercussions all the way down the system, particularly in our in our in our system of government with a limited, uh, with limited government. Um, one of the important things that the judiciary, federal judiciary does is it uh, ha is the final arbiter and what the meaning of the Constitution is. And that is important to make sure that our co-equal branches of government stay within their designated powers within, um, within our Constitution. The uh, important part of upholding the rule of law also is to protect uh, the rights of individuals, even if uh, on the other side of the V, the other side of the lawsuit is a government agency. Um, and uh, to do that in a fair and impartial manner without fear of reprisal uh, or uh, without uh, concern from outside influences. So those are among the reasons that upholding the rule of law and enforcing the rule of law require an independent judiciary and why it is uh, so important. So um, you seem to have, you seem to attract FOIA 
cases. So <laughs> since 2012, you have ruled on more than 140 FOIA cases. Did you know that before we told when you? you? <laughs> when I saw that in the question, I thought, is that right? <laughs> And I actually had one of my law clerks who's sitting over here in the front row to check that. And since I've been on the bench, it's been over 150. Oh my God! Really? <laughs> but but not but not because um, I got on the bench and uh, I was I, I was confirmed and had my commission signed in 2010. But I took the bench in January 2011, so it goes back one one additional year. I mean the. Uh, court uh, in DC in our nation's capital is a very busy magnet for um, FOIA cases. Um, I all FOIA cases when they're filed are randomly assigned so all of uh -huh. my colleagues get the same random assignment of FOIA cases that just not all landing on my desk thank goodness um, and um, I think you know, just not to bore people with statistics, but five years ago, uh, about five years ago, uh, FOIA cases made up only about 10 or 12 percent of the docket on the in the on my court. Uh, they now make up almost double that uh, oh, right. in terms of the numbers in our docket. Um, and uh, about five years ago, uh, the district court for the District of Columbia handled about 50% of all the FOIA filings across the country amongst mm -hmm. all the federal district courts. Um, and we're now, um, uh, our work on FOIA cases is about 65% of all the FOIA, mm -hmm. FOIA filings across um, the whole, the whole um, country. And the numbers have, of FOIA cases have more than doubled in the last five years. You don't years. have to tell these people. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so, um, yes, our numbers are, are way up. I think I've, there are independent uh, groups that have said that the FOIA filings keep going up and are at their highest numbers ever. We feel it in our court. So when you're reviewing the facts in FOIA litigation, how do you evaluate agencies? Um, well, and then also requesters. And also requesters. Right. Well, you know, FOIA, the agencies bear the burden in FOIA cases. They bear the burden of showing that they conducted an adequate search for, for uh, responsive documents. They bear the burden of, of showing that they reasonably interpreted the FOIA request in terms of the scope of their search. And they bear the burden of showing that they applied the FOIA uh, as, as required um, in terms of uh, the documents that were produced as well as the documents that were withheld under a FOIA exemption. And so um, we, I, as every other judge does, we scrutinize uh, those FOIA declarations very carefully. Um, and it is a pleasure when we get very detailed, well-organized Vaughn indices that talk about all the documents that were withheld and the justifications for it that make sense and are reasonable. We presume agencies act in good faith, and it's uh, only a rare FOIA case where, where a FOIA requester, the plaintiff in the case, alleges that uh, there was bad faith in some form. Um, it is a matter of uh, last resort, uh, although uh, to, to examine the records in camera, meaning in our chambers, um, although uh, FOIA requesters uh, frequently request that uh, judges look at the documents in camera to do a double check. Um, personally, I do feel that, it, that the uh, DC Circuit has gotten it right when they've said that should be absolutely the last resort because as soon as a judge takes documents to do that double check uh, in camera, in chambers, um, it is uh, distorting the advocacy process uh, mm. that, and, and, uh, and basically um, reducing the transparency in the judgment making. And so um, I am usually very reluctant to look at documents in camera. And that's why, even though it's a pain for everybody involved, most judges send, uh, when the agency's justifications or de declarations in describing what they've done is insufficient, we send it back to the agency to do it again to have transparency in the litigation. Usually, it's not until the third or fourth time that I finally just say, send me the documents to look at in camera. But that's why. I mean, I think some 
uh, some uh, you know, FOIA requesters may think, why don't they just look at them? They would feel more comfortable if the judge looked at them. And um, this has given me an opportunity to explain why that is not, uh, that is not an option that judges embrace. It's not because we, are, we are, don't want to look at the documents. Sometimes we're pretty curious. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, it's for the transparency of the litigation. And on the requester side? And on the requester side, I mean, the requesters don't bear the burden. Um, and so, and from the uh, operation of the FOIA statute, it doesn't matter who the requester is, whether the requester is a citizen, a non citizen, an organization, an individual, or not. It doesn't matter what the, the purpose of the records request is. Um, unless you're dealing with some administrative matters uh, in the operation of the FOIA uh, in terms of expedited processing or fee waivers. But otherwise, uh, the purpose of the FOIA request, the identity of the requester is irrelevant to our review. Um, but that being said, uh, a FOIA uh, plaintiff, in a, in a, in a, uh, a FOIA requester who is a plaintiff uh, in litigation has the same obligation and we judges have the same expectation of that plaintiff as we do of any other party in civil, litig in civil litigation in federal court. We expect them to be reasonable. And for example, if an agency has made an offer to produce tranches of documents on a rolling basis and the requester doesn't like the production plan, we really want to hear some pretty good reasons why that's not going to not going to work. So unreasonable FOIA requesters in litigation mm -hmm. are just as much of a pain in the neck as unreasonable litigants in any other case. And so we do expect uh, civility and reasonableness uh, from uh, FOIA requesters who are plaintiffs in, in, in litigation. So then. Um what are your views on whether it's appropriate for requesters to jump the line in filing a lawsuit? Hmm. Um, jumping the line, okay, it, it typically comes up when um, agencies raise concerns about production schedules uh, because of the allocation of resources within a particular agency and the agency says, if we uh, don't have a more flexible production schedule for this particular FOIA requester, uh, non-litigating FOIA requesters' requests will be uh, added to a backlog. Um, and I have to say that is a consideration that um, I hear and I consider, but I don't think I'm alone as a federal judge has a responsibility not just to that particular FOIA litigation, but everybody else waiting for my decision. Um, I have to move the litigation along as expeditiously and fairly as possible, and so jumping the line becomes a secondary consideration. Um, there are a number of ways that, in tools that judges have, uh, and every FOIA requester and agency uh, official listening, um, has seen these tools uh, and mechanisms that judges have invoked, you know, to require you know the parties and FOIA litigation to talk to each other to see if they can come up with a with a with, with a, a schedule that's can accommodate everybody's interests. Um, I sometimes when I am, um, have an agency complaining about line jumping. Uh, can ask the agency to really explain in a lot more detail how they've allocated resources uh, to accommodate the, both the litigating FOIA, FOIA requests and the non-litigating FOIA requests. But ultimately, as I said, line jumping concerns are secondary to me moving my docket. Um, I failed to mention this earlier, but the judge has agreed to take uh, questions at, at the end, so we're going to reserve some time, and there are microphones on either side, so start thinking about what you want to talk about. So this one I have to read because it's just so complicated. Um, Nonprofit advocacy groups filing FOIA lawsuits accounted for 36 percent of all FOIA suits in fiscal year 16. Um, I'm sure Alina wrote this. Swelling to 50 percent of FOIA suits in, um, eight, in 18, according to the FOIA project run by, the, by track at Syracuse University. What are your views on the increase in the number of lawsuits filed by these groups on both sides of the political spectrum 
many of which rushed to court on day 21 uh, and maybe using FOIA for purely political reasons. Your views? Um, it shows that FOIA is alive and well and an important <laughs> tool in our democracy. Um, as I said, the identity of the FOIA requester is irrelevant, as is the purpose of the FOIA request. Um, judges are focused on our job, which is in each particular FOIA request, has the agency conducted an adequate search? Uh, and has the agency complied with the requirements of FOIA in both its production and its application of the exemptions? Um, and, you know, I think um, there are a number of ways for people to get information that they want about how federal agencies are operating. Um, this may be a sign, but that's up for, that's for people with a different skill set than mine to answer. Um, that people are feeling like they're not getting information in the myriad of other ways that people can, can find out about what their government agencies are up to. Um, so that may be a sign of that as opposed to, um, you know, uh, the FOIA, the increase in FOIA requests for political purposes, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, is some sign of uh, additional uh, edits to the FOIA statute being required. We'll bring that up with Senator Leahy when he's here. Yes. So from your perspective, what are the biggest challenges you observe in FOIA litigation? Um, I, I think based on what I hear from agencies, there's a constant refrain about uh, resources, resource issues. It's a refrain that uh, harkens back to my days on the Hill, um, where uh, in, in doing oversight of how FOIA was being implemented in federal agencies, there was you know, a constant concern uh, whether the FOIA operations within agencies were being um, starved of resources or being given adequate resources, whatever that might mean. Um, in particular, agencies that also have mission critical things that they needed to fund. Um, so resource issues continue to be something that, um, you know, I think judges hear about uh, in setting deadlines for uh, uh, determinations of uh, responses to FOIA requests and uh, production schedules. I think another challenge um, that I guess I might be partially to blame for since I did have a job at one point when I worked on the Hill uh, of uh, helping to draft statutory language. The FOIA is not an easy statute. Um, and the exemptions can be sometimes dense and difficult to understand. Um, you, know, I, you know, even sort of as fundamental and key a term as what is an agency record um, can, can be difficult to understand. Um, and I mean, I, my, you know, I have a, you know, one personal case I can talk about involving you know, the, the White House um, visitor logs, which is one of my early cases in the FOIA, where you know, I look at um, what agency record has meant uh, in other cases and borrowed from the Privacy Act. Um, and I looked at the White House visitor logs and saw, well, it's the Secret Service that creates them, maintains them, uses them. Secret Service is an agency, White House visitor logs, they're, an ag they're agency records subject to the FOIA, as opposed to presidential records subject to the re disclosure regime under the Presidential Records Act. Well, I was wrong according to the DC Circuit and I was reversed. And those Secret Service White House visitor logs were not agency records at all. Well, um, in that case, the agency was right, I was wrong, uh, but it was an open question. So the FOIA is not, um, you know, is, is not in necessarily an easy statute. And so agency personnel have to make judgment calls, I think, quite regularly on what the scope of exemptions are. Um, and they, they do their best, as do district court judges. So you've opened the door about changing the legislation. What, what other recommendations? This, um, defining records, which we have done. Oh, I'm not recommending that, that the <laughs> definition of agency record be defined. So what, what I am so out of the business of doing policy work. Um, I, that is not my, that's not my recommendation. I think the courts do just fine. Um, but, um, and I uh, would, 
I, you know, in terms of recommendations for changes to the FOIA, um, uh, you know, I don't really look at the FOIA that way anymore. Um, I just do the best I can in interpreting it. Um, and so, I mean, I do think that um, Congress, in looking at the FOIA, shouldn't forget its oversight role in uh, focusing on resource allocations with, within mm -hmm. agencies to make it work um, as well as it can and should. Um, uh, there's, you know, there, there, you know, there are areas where FOIA is, uh, in some ways, you could say, sort of amended but not transparently, uh, because the exemption three non-FOIA exemptions can be scattered throughout mm -hmm. the rule books mm -hmm. um, and adopted by committees without the expertise that the Senate and House Judiciary Committees have with the FOIA. Um, and sometimes those uh, non-FOIA exemption three statutes can be clarifying, uh, but sometimes they can um, undercut uh, the uh, goals of, of the FOIA in ways that um, you know are, are, are not helpful or necessary. So speaking of Congress, um, should Congress be subject to FOIA? <laughs> uh, yes, that's a that's a, that's a that's a question with a with a long lineage. Um, personally, I don't think it should be. Um, and I don't know where Senator Leahy stands on that question anymore. It may be an area where we disagree, actually. Um, I, don't think, I, I don't think that the FOIA should apply to Congress. Most of the work of Congress is public already, both in terms of the introduction of legislation and committee hearings and committee reports um, with um, uh, anti-corruption reporting in terms of campaign finance contributions and financial disclosure forms. Um, there are also constitutional uh, uh, prerogatives that, that Congress has been granted in Article I, uh, from the speech and debate clause to the journaling clause that expressly, in the journaling clause in, in Article I, Section 5, expressly says that Congress can keep private some of its, uh, mm -hmm. its proceedings. In order to give uh, the legislature uh, room for deliberations in, in secret, so, um, for, and I do think that for accountability purposes, if people are concerned about the lack of transparency about what's going on in Congress, um, they have uh, the ability in the voting booth to act on that. Uh, and so I actually don't think that FOIA has a role to play when it comes to Congress. How about the courts? Uh, I, for some of those same reasons, <laughs> I don't think that FOIA should apply uh, to the courts. Um, the, you know, the default uh, process in the courts is public. Uh, you know, the Sixth Amendment requires uh, that there be a public trial in all criminal prosecutions um, and all, virtually all court proceedings, unless there's a very good reason that's demonstrated the default is transparency. Plus judges, when they issue decisions, they do it in a public way with all of their reasons listed. Uh, for anti-corruption purposes, all judges also file financial disclosure forms um, so that uh, people can see that. In terms of accountability, if people don't like the reasons, they can appeal it uh, to another court. Um, and so uh, I just, I, I don't think that um, the FOIA has a role to play uh, when it comes to the judiciary either. And as a constitutional matter, um, I think that uh, the judicial power is well, well located within Article III and that regulating records or other operations within the judiciary raises significant separation of power concerns. Mm -hmm. I've never had to address it in an opinion, so hopefully this will not ever come back to bite me. But <laughs> that would be my initial impression without a deep research or uh, advocacy. So in October, you unsealed um, Watergate Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski's roadmap, the last um, secret Watergate document 
Yes, thank you for, to the archives for all of its cooperation in that matter. Well, thank you for... Not that I left you much choice with the orders. That's right. <laughs> it was an order. <laughs> so your order was issued after three plaintiffs pe uh, petitioned the court to unseal the document, which um, still remained protected. So should there be a historical exception for release of grand jury records? Or should grand jury proceedings, once a secret, remain a secret? This goes to your docket mm -hmm. project. Um, well, <clears throat> as a general matter, uh, grand jury matters uh, should remain secret, uh, both to protect the reputations of people who may have been exonerated by the grand jury, protect witnesses, uh, identity, um, for all the security uh, issues that a grand jury secrecy traditionally applies. At the same time, having a historical exception to uh, the grand jury secrecy rule, which is set out in Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 6E, uh, is, uh, you know, jumps over uh, sort of an underlying issue, which is how much power do judges have inherently to um, disclose grand jury matters that uh, in ways that are not explicitly provided under 6E, which has a number of exceptions um, and requires secrecy on the behalf of a number of enumerated uh, participants in a grand jury proceeding. Judges are not included on that list. This is an issue that the DC Circuit is considering right now. Um, and in a case called McKeever v. Sessions, maybe it's McKeever v. Whitaker now, I don't know what the current name is, but it's McKeever, brought by a researcher who has sought uh, disclosure of um, grand jury materials in a murder investigation. And Judge Lambert, uh, one of my colleagues, issued a decision affirming that judges have inherent power beyond the enumerated reasons, exceptions set out in Rule 6E, uh, but declined to exercise that inherent, in power, inherent power and disclose the materials requested. That's a matter that's now before the DC Circuit, uh, which um, may resolve the issue of whether uh, the court has inherent power, which will come back to the mm -hmm. Watergate roadmap mm -hmm. because although I disclosed huge chunks of that roadmap that had already been publicly um, revealed. Mm -hmm. There are chunks of the roadmap that remain sealed. And that case has been stayed until I am, can, am given guidance by the DC Circuit about whether I have the inherent authority to unseal more. And if so, what the um, considerations would be for me to exercise my inherent power to unseal more of the Watergate roadmap. Where are we with? So um, let's um, do two minutes on court of uh, cameras in federal courtrooms. Oh. And then we'll go to Q&A. Okay. Um, so usually it's the Supreme Court that's talked about uh, when cameras in the courtroom are discussed. Um, and of course, the judicial conference uh, policy is that um, there are, there's no broadcasting um, of uh, court proceedings in, in district court. Um, in circuit courts, uh, you know, the train has already left that station mm -hmm. because in circuit courts, uh, they're allowing broadcasting of audio and a number of live, live broadcasting of audio of circuit arguments. Uh, the Ninth Circuit, at least, has live broadcasting of both video and audio. Um, and, uh, but the ban on all broadcasting in district courts remains. And in criminal cases, one can understand that you wouldn't want um, you know, witnesses uh, uh, you know, in, the, in criminal cases cases uh, to have their names and their testimony broadcast influencing other witnesses' testimony. So district courts, the, the broadcasting ban and camera ban in district courts is understandable um, because we have witnesses and we have criminal cases and, and in fact, uh, Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure, uh, 53 bans photographs and, and broadcasting uh, uh, in, in criminal proceedings in district court. 
I think it's overdone. Mm -hmm. um, we have, we on district court often have oral argument in uh, Administrative Procedure Act cases, uh, challenging agency actions uh, in FOIA cases uh, where there are no witnesses uh, and it is purely uh, argument uh, about the law and how that law applies to particular facts and I don't see any reason why the broadcasting ban in district court should apply to those kinds of proceedings. Um, but um, right now, uh, the judicial uh, conference policy applies across the board. There are, there are some pilot programs going on in the Ninth Circuit uh, in district court where they're allowing uh, broadcasting of audio and video live. Um, and um, that pilot program has been going on for a decade. I don't know how the Ninth Circuit gets away with it, but they do. That's a long pilot. And even after the pilot was done, the Judicial Conference said, after the pilot was done, we, agree, we want to keep our current rule, but some of those Ninth Circuit district courts continue to move along with the pilot so, and, awesome. and have it. So, so um, there are microphones on either Either side, if you have a question for the for the judge and Alex, you've been standing there since I announced it. <laughs> this is your opportunity <laughs> to ask me questions. Well, there's no uh, recourse to the court, so I can't jump the line. Ah. <laughs> um, I do appreciate your comments today and the National Archives for hosting this annual celebration. Uh, my name is Alex Howard. I've been uh, fortunate to come back to these year after year and see you open up this house to these kinds of questions, even when they're some kind, sometimes meandering. Um, so I'll try to make these specific. Um, has Congress codifying the presumption of openness into the FOIA changed your jurisprudence in the years since? Are agency websites, social media updates, instant messages or private messages on apps, public records, subject to the FOIA, and should the PACER system, which I just checked out on dcd.uscourts.gov, that website, <laughs> be free and open to the public? Currently, I believe that system is making a profit for the United States government as opposed to being fully open and accessible. And I thank you in advance. Okay, those comments. are three questions. Okay, let me see if I remember them all. Um, so your first question was about the codification of the presumption of openness. Mm -hmm. um, I have not cited that in any of my written opinions. Um, has, so I, and I can't say that it's ever been argued to me um, in any of my uh, cases so far. So um, I can't say that it has necessarily affected my jurisprudence but since the FOIA itself has a presumption of disclosure, which I talk about in every single one of my opinions, it might be redundant uh, to, to talk about that. And you know, both the presumption of disclosure, in, which is the overarching goal of FOIA, and to, uh, which is bolstered by narrowly defining exceptions, exemptions. So, I can't say I've ever cited it, but I'm not sure it would change my jurisprudence at all. Your second question, I know you've asked about PACER. What, your second question is whether something is an agency record. Whether web records or electronic records Social generated media. from these devices are public records and thus subject to public records uh, requests. Well, emails certainly are. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I haven't actually addressed that issue. Um, but I would say that generally they probably are. Um, so that would be my, that would be my off the top of the head uh, response to that. Although it might, uh, you know, I, I think that there are, I, I might be more careful and say it depends, <laughs> you know, whether it was a personal device, you know, how much it was used personally, et cetera, and those kinds of uh, might be agency specific uh, directions on the use of cell phones. So, um, but that would be my, my, I'd say there'd be a presumption that it would, mm -hmm. but it would ultimately depend on circumstances. 
Um, with respect to the PACER fees, I know that has been subject of litigation in my court. Judge Huvel, Ellen Huvel, has been in charge of that litigation. Um, when the PACER system was set up, there was a statutory requirement to the courts to charge a fee for it and to have that charge cover um, the cost of the PACER system. Um, so the fact that PACER is not free is because of the statute. Whether the judiciary has um, charged too much for PACER, I think is something that, uh, or is charged excessive fees for that, I think is something that's in, been in litigation before uh, Judge Ravel, and I'm not that familiar with all the circumstances of that or her rulings. Thank you. I note in uh, parting that I think 46 out of the 50 states plus DC have legislatures that are subject to their public records laws, and they seem to function okay. <laughs> So I'm not expecting to be in front of you arguing this anytime soon, <laughs> um, but it does appear you can subject legislatures to public records laws and still have them be able to hold up. So Lawrence, in your panel discussion, you might address the second question that Alex had. Anna. Hi. Um, we talked a lot about how FOIA only applies to the executive branch, um, but the Federal Records Act applies to all three branches. And so I wonder, in your role as chief judge, where you have some administrative responsibilities, um, if you've thought about your record keeping responsibilities, particularly with regard to judges' personal papers, which sort of live in this weird ether um, of often considered property, maybe not record, but maybe should be record, um, and your record keeping obligations vis-a-vis -vis the Federal Records Act, particularly with regard to judges' emails. Yes. Um, We've had a number of meetings um, with the judges about re preserving their records and their records obligations. Um, and it is uh, pretty much left up to each individual judge uh, to uh, figure out how they're gonna preserve both their paper records and their electronic records. We have some judges that operate fully on paper some judges who are fully electronic, and some judges like me who are someplace in between. Um, and we have talked to the judges about how all their papers would probably come to the, the archives um, at some point unless they are holding them themselves. So um, I haven't spent a lot of time focusing on it, but we've had a number of meetings with judges with no great resolution since each judge uh, pretty much does what he or she would like to do. Um, and find libraries to take their papers and so on, so. It's uh, similar to the members of Congress, the same <coughs> approach. Non-uniform, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Very much. Yes, you've ruled in more than over more. You've ruled on more than uh, over more than a hundred cases, 150 cases. Pardon me. Um, is there an aspect of the FOIA that you find to be more confusing than most frequently confusing in your case in the cases that you've reviewed? I think that there are some exemptions in application that are uh, more challenging than others. I think. Um, the deliberative process privilege under Exemption 5 uh, is particularly challenging, I think, for agencies and also f in order to describe the pre-decisional nature of uh, the specific decision that's at issue in a particular document that they're trying to withhold. So I think there is a lot of litigation over Exemption 5 deliberative process privilege. Although I think um, a couple of my colleagues have recently been reversed on application of uh, Exemption 7C, so that may also be getting realigned a little bit by the circuit. Thank you very much for coming today. Would have been some of the more difficult to decide cases uh, as to whether or not an agency has been reasonable in uh, conducting a search of its, its uh, documentary material for a FOIA. The, 
you know, those are those those decisions are usually not that hard. Um, uh, sometimes the agency hasn't described uh, well how they uh, interpreted a FOIA request uh, and why they decided to, um, uh, uh, you know, refer the FOIA request for searches of responsive documents to some components and not others. I mean, I, I think sometimes uh, sometimes the agency is has sort of missed the boat, and then they go back and have to do a, re uh, do a new search. Um, I think when agencies have questions and they've consulted with the FOIA requester or taken some uh, suggestions from the FOIA requester, um, they do a better job of doing the search, or at least they have teed up why they think the FOIA requester's request to search certain components or certain systems um, you know, doesn't make sense in that context. So it, where an agency has failed to consult with the FOIA requester and just gone off on its own, sometimes they miss things. Um, and sometimes it's just they missed it uh, and they have to go back and expand their search. Um, sometimes they just haven't described everything they've done very well and they have to just say, we actually did that, but we didn't detail that for you, and uh, they come back and do that. Um, but those, those I, I don't find those to be particularly hard issues. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you. You just dropped your machine. Thanks. Bus discussion of FOIA. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've definitely given us a lot to think about, so thank you for that. Um, we are now going to quickly and hopefully seamlessly rearrange our stage. Um, and I would like, in the meantime, to invite our first panel to start slowly making their way up to the stage. Um, so we can turn our attention to an issue that is certainly near and dear to my heart, um, all about OGIS. So as I mentioned earlier, OGIS uh, turns 10 later this year. And in recognition of that anniversary, uh, we have brought together a panel of distinguished and knowledgeable speakers who will take you back to the origins of OGIS, the early years, the present, and the OGIS of tomorrow. We have strategically included all of our speakers' uh, biographies in the handout available before you walked into the McGowan Theater. Hopefully everyone picked one up. Looks like this. Uh, and the goal is to minimize introductions and maximize our speakers' time on, um, on our panels this afternoon. First, uh, let me introduce Tom Sussman, who will moderate our panel. Tom is currently the director of the Governmental Affairs Office at the American Bar Association. Uh, he joined the ABA after 27 years as a partner in the law firm of Ropes and Gray. Before that, uh, he was chief counsel to the Senate Subcommittee on Administrative Practice and Procedure and held other government positions. Uh, Tom's involvement with FOIA began at the Department of Justice when he advised agencies regarding the new law. In a Senate position, he was the principal staff lawyer for enactment of the 1974 amendments uh, of FOIA. That's why I sometimes refer to him as the grandfather of FOIA. I don't think he gets terribly upset with me when I say that. Um, also at Ropes and Gray, he handled many FOIA-related litigation and regulatory matters, including the work that resulted in the issuance of uh, President Reagan's executive order requiring agencies to give notice to submitters before releasing confidential business information. Currently, we are pleased to have Tom serving in a second term as a member of the National Archives FOIA Advisory Committee. Tom promises to both moderate the discussion and chime in with his own knowledgeable commentary. Uh, joining us today is Judge Lydia Grigsby of the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Before her appointment to the bench in 2014, Judge Grigsby served as the Chief Counsel for Privacy and Information Policy for the Senate Judiciary Committee, a position to which she was appointed by Senator Patrick Leahy. There's a lot of ongoing theme here today. And she also served as Privacy Counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee. She was the lead Senate counsel on several key FOIA amendments, including the Open Government Act of 2007, 
the legislation that created our office, OGIS, and the Open FOIA Act of 2009. We are also pleased to welcome Krista Boyd, General Counsel for Chairman Elijah Cummings on the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. Uh, Krista's long association with the committee has given her a front seat for several FOIA reforms on the House side, including her active involvement with the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016. Finally, um, please join me in welcoming Miriam Nisbet, the founding director of OGIS, um, and I dare say the mother of dragons. <laughs> the birth of OGIS, just like the birth of Daenerys' dragons, was unique, magical, wondrous, and a miracle. And like Daenerys, Miriam walked into the flames and lived, and she will talk about those experiences and the legacy she has left. And that legacy I try to carry on presently and into the future, and um, I'll do my best to cover those aspects. So with that introduction, I'm going to gingerly walk over to the panel, and Tom will begin. Great, thank you. Uh, as, we, uh, as we open the program, I think it's uh, appropriate to pay special thanks to David Ferriero. Uh, he uh, celebrates his 10th year, too, uh, and I think it's no coincidence that uh, uh, OGIS uh, has continued as a strong and uh, vibrant uh, office within the archives uh, under David's leadership. Um, I should note that uh, it was established under the previous archivist, uh, Adrian Thomas, uh, but also, um, and I can't, oh yeah, Gary Stern is here, General Counsel of Archives, uh, has been a, uh, a continuing uh, supporter uh, starting from when the legislation was enacted uh, up through tomorrow uh, and beyond, we hope. Uh, before turning to our panel, I, I'd like to set the stage with a little background because uh, there are other individuals who deserve some recognition uh, in terms of the origins of the Office of Government Information Services. Um, some names may not be familiar to you, uh, like Suzanne Legault, uh, the Canadian Information Commissioner, um, former Connecticut FOI Commissioner Mitch Perlman, uh, Bob Freeman, who is Executive Director of the uh, New York Committee on Open Government, because they all uh, led agencies or offices that were seen as models uh, for the United States and were studied by Mark Grunewald of Washington and Lee Law School, who in 19 87 came up with a paper for the Administrative Conference of the United States that looked at the statistics on FOIA cases, FOIA litigation, uh, interviewed uh, litigators and requesters and government officials, studied uh, the comparative uh, uh, institutions in the states and uh, foreign countries, and concluded uh, to recommend the creation of an administrative tribunal uh, for administrative decision-making on freedom of information cases. And as an alternative, he examined and uh, explored the ombudsman con concept. Um, and uh, I, actually, I was a member of the administrative conference at the time. Mark's first choice was the administrative tribunal. Uh, it met with um, strong opposition from the executive branch uh, led by the Justice Department. And the conclusion was uh, a statement uh, that um, simply said that data uh, currently available don't establish the need for either uh, an ombuds office or a adjudicative tribunal, uh, but that uh, the agencies and Department of Justice should explore voluntary use of informal alternative dispute mechanisms. Uh, it took a decade before the data in terms of cases and disputes suggested that perhaps some alternative was necessary, was useful, uh, and that's when uh, Congress stepped forth to address the problem by establishing OGIS. Um, we'll take you back to that period and to some of the uh, early years of uh, legislative development and uh, st standing up of OGIS and amendments, but I, I wanna start uh, I know most of the people who are watching us and who are in the audience know OGIS, but I think it'd be useful to start with uh, where are we now uh, with Alina to give us an idea, uh, you know, what are you doing and how are you doing it and uh, uh, should, should we be appropriately celebrating uh, OGIS these days? 
Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to toot our own horn. Um, certainly we are robust and uh, we have a absolutely amazing staff and I'm so proud of all the accomplishments that um, have actually happened this past year. In particular, we put out our annual report um, despite the fact that we were shut down for 35 days. Uh, we also put this event together with despite the shutdown, so that's wonderful to also celebrate. Um, the annual report certainly gives a lot of statistics. David cited to some earlier. Um, our dispute resolution program is um, busier than ever. Uh, we continue to try to open, uh, foster open and effective dialogue uh, between requesters and agencies. And uh, one thing that I, I know I have a very short time, so Tom warned me, I, I definitely want to flag one area that I think we've really tried to focus on and most recently, which is that we believe that OGIS has a unique opportunity to use the lessons we have been learning from our dispute resolution program um, to inform several other areas of our work. Uh, and specifically, we are looking for trends that we can use uh, for our future advisory opinions, our FOIA ombuds observers, and some of our compliance assessments. And that's um, very much in the forefront of our minds. We were very excited to be able to issue our first advisory opinion last year. Uh, prior to the passage of the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016, we were a little more um, uh, constrained, I would say, because it was associated with issuing uh, an advisory opinion in the context of a particular dispute. And we really struggled with that um, because we had a, a hard time uh, justifying uh, giving out an advisory opinion when uh, we have impartiality and um, and the uh, confidentiality that exists between the parties that engage in the uh, mediation process. So we were very grateful when Congress recognized that tension and uh, gave us the opportunity to issue advisory opinions at our discretion. And so we're going to continue down that path and, um, and issue some uh, additional advisory opinions. I'm also very pleased with our compliance program uh, this past year, um, despite the fact that um, we had a lot going on already. We issued five compliance assessments, which is quite a feat. Uh, we looked at the uh, US um, CIS and US Postal Service, and uh, we also did uh, three issue assessments. We used actually um, the auspices of our chief records officer um, and his office to uh, look at some questions related to FOIA and the records management self-assessment. Um, and we issued a, um, an assessment on agencies providing required notices of dispute resolution, which we tied to our advisory opinion. Um, so there's definitely overlap. Do I have one more minute? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> we've done so much. Um, I'm also very um, excited about all the work we've done in training. Um, we have done a lot of dispute resolution training for FOIA professionals. This year in particular, we seem to have a lot of success with training at particular agencies. Um, so we've gone to individual agencies and, and conducted training. Actually, we have them come to us. That way they're actually paying attention during the day <laughs> and they're not running away. And uh, that seems to have been very successful. We have uh, engaged in a lot of outreach and education. We're always uh, taking every opportunity we can to talk about OGIS, uh, both nationally and internationally um, at ASAP. Uh, we uh, participated in OIP training. Uh, we've also this past year spoken to SIGI, uh, the Council on Integrity, and I'm always forgetting the name of the acronym. It's the Council of uh, Inspectors General. Uh, we talked to them about uh, ways that we could uh, cross-pollinate and work together on, on FOIA issues. Uh, I'm also very proud of the work that the FOIA Advisory Committee has been doing. Thank you, Tom. Um, we issued a great report last year that contained seven recommendations to the archivist and over 42 best practices. And uh, this year's FOIA Advisory Committee, this term's FOIA Advisory Committee, I should say, which started last year, is um, moving quite along very well and um, has actually one particular subcommittee that's going to be looking at the future of OGIS, which makes me a little nervous, but we'll see what happens. Uh, the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016, I'll finish with this, um, also um, asked us to have an open annual meeting, and we've been doing that and taking the opportunity to provide the public with updates about what our office is up to, but we also have taken an opportunity to spread the word about the FOIA Advisory Committee best practices, so 
uh, Tom was actually participating in a panel last year that uh, we hosted to talk about the best practices. And the Chief Way Officers Council has now met several times. Uh, we have co-hosted that event with the uh, Department of Justice. Uh, Melanie Paste, the director of OIP, and I co-chair that, and uh, we've hosted it here, and we're back again here later this year on August 5th. Mark your calendars. And uh, last but not least, we are continuing to engage in uh, our social media presence. We have a very robust blog, which I know everyone is following. Uh, everyone is also following us on Twitter, and, uh, and everyone is checking our website. So that's it. Is that okay? Great. And I should note that you have an annual report that's just come out. Yes. And by some strange coincidence, its title is OGIS at 10. <laughs> past, present, and future, which was so clever that uh, we're using the name for our program today. Well, let, let's, uh, let's turn the clock back a little bit. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, uh, Judge Grigsby, uh, Senator Cornyn spoke, and uh, he stressed on at least two or three times during his talk about uh, the uh, bipartisan nature of his close work with Senator Leahy. Uh, you, of course, were uh, the chief uh, staff on Senator, for Senator Leahy on the Judiciary Committee, uh, a, um, uh, a long-standing, very important position. Uh, that is, people who did FOIA for the Judiciary Committee dates back into the 70s, at least, uh, when I was on the Hill doing FOIA for the Judiciary Committee. Um, but uh, uh, give us, uh, give us some, some of your sort of reminiscence in terms of congressional intent, the legislative history, um, you know, and, and how this bipartisanship really shone through to give rise to, to OGIS over uh, some objections. Sure, my pleasure, and good afternoon, everyone. Happy 10th anniversary, OGIS. I cannot believe it's been a decade. Uh, my, my time uh, involved with OGIS goes back to the beginning, before there was an OGIS, so I'm delighted to be back with the rest of the band. Most of the folks up here were actually co-partners with me in trying to get the uh, office established. Um, I previously worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I can tell you that the journey uh, to creating this office was a rather long one. Um, and it kind of had its seeds back in the years right after 9-11, where the country started grappling with the concept of government secrecy and transparency and where to strike the balance. As you may recall, at that time, there was a great emphasis on secrecy to protect national security uh, and privacy. Uh, but there was a recalibration uh, in the Congress and I think in the country in the years thereafter to figure out how to ensure the public's right to know. And so back in 2005, bar partisanship was actually alive in Congress, and Senator Leahy and Senator Cornyn partnered together on legislation that would eventually become the bill that created OGIS. And that partnership was, at that time, somewhat rare, but uh, something that I think the Congress recognized on issues of transparency was appropriate. And so even from the very beginning, there was very broad support across the Congress for the idea of looking at FOIA and improving uh, government transparency. Uh, so back in 2005, the first legislation that would have started uh, the path to the Open Government Act was uh, introduced by those two senators. And then Congress got to work on a series of hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee, as well as hearings in the House, as I recall, um, to start looking at the issue. And it was in 2007, two years later, that the actual legislation, the Open Government Act, was introduced by those two senators that would eventually become um, law and become the home of uh, create OGIS, I should say. Um, so I think the important thing to remember about that time is that uh, I heard earlier a question about the presumption of openness. I can tell you in the Congress that was a big deal. And that was actually the area where most in Congress unified. And in fact, in the findings in the legislation, that presumption is in there. And that was because uh, there was a broad view that while FOIA was extremely important in ensuring openness, it wasn't actually meeting its ideals at the time. And so many members, uh, through oversight, uh, became concerned about how the bill was actually, how the law was actually working and wanted to make sure that it was clear that Congress believed that there was a presumption of openness in our country. And I can tell you at the time, that was a, a subject of debate, quite frankly, given where we were. So at least from the perspective of Congress at the time, it's my view that was very important and a very important part of the bill. Um, so in any event, the path to creating OGIS uh, began in 2005. 
The bill was enacted in 2007. Uh, there was a lot of important work done um, in the Senate and in the House to get to that point, as well as important work after the bill was enacted uh, to ensure that OGIS in particular uh, stayed in place. One of the key issues I know for um, the Senate, at least, was making sure OGIS was an independent office. As you may know, there are other offices in the government that deal with FOIA oversight. Uh, but again, there was a great effort by Senator Leahy, both in the legislation and in the years following the legislation, to ensure that OGIS actually was in a place in our government um, that could be, be independent of other parts of the government, particularly those that involved in FOIA litigation. Um, so that's kind of a brief overview of the legislative history and background. Well, l let me ask you to go one step further because uh, my recollection was after OGIS was established uh, in 2007, uh, it, took a, it took a few years to finally get it started because there was some, uh, I guess, uh, tension within the executive branch as to who ought to lead uh, the uh, FOIA dispute resolution, and uh, there was a, a, an appropriations battle as well that I know you played an important role in. That's you're, you're my hero for that. <laughs> so I want you to discuss it a little bit. Yeah. Well, again, the concept of a new office to deal with FOIA, whether it's oversight of the ombudsman role, which is very important, at least in, in terms of Congress at the time, was a novel one and one where there were many parts of the executive branch that felt they were already doing that to some extent or didn't want to have another pair of eyes looking at it. Uh, and so obviously once legislation is enacted, you can obviously defund things. And so there was a big issue about defunding the office. And both Senator Leahy and Senator Cornyn were very uh, active and adamant about making sure the office was properly funded and pushing back on efforts to defund the program as it started up. I think that continues today, quite frankly, in terms of making sure the office is funded. So that was a very important issue. But again, I think the one thing I would emphasize is, again, this really was not a controversial uh, issue within the Congress at the time. While I would say it perhaps was not unanimous, there was very strong support, uh, bipartisan support, uh, really from the inception of the legislation to do something in this area. And I believe OGIS continues to have great support in Congress because of that history. Uh, I think that's right, and uh, as many of you may have guessed by now, I'm a OGIS groupie, so uh, you're not going to find a lot of balance in my questioning. Uh, but as we move to, uh, from the legislative origin uh, to the birth of the office, um, I, I do want to say again that I, I remember those years, and uh, the, uh, the Department of Justice was using very sharp elbows to try to make sure that it maintained a uh, paramount role uh, on all things FOIA, uh, including as ombuds uh, and including, I believe, uh, initially trying to move some of the budget funds from OGIS to the Justice Department. Uh, and, uh, and so, Miriam, when you came back from Paris, where you were working, uh, uh, doing intellectual property uh, issues, uh, in, uh, to uh, to Washington to take over a brand new to build a brand new office in the face of perhaps not congressional di uh, uh, dispute, but uh, certainly executive branch tensions. Um, give us some feeling for those good old days. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Tom, for that question and. Um, I just want to thank um, OGIS and, um, and the archives for having this celebration. Um, I will tell you that when I walked in the door of the archives in September 2009, um, my challenges were so obvious and they, <laughs> they, I didn't realize some of the other challenges that were lurking because the first thing we had to do was find office space and find staff. <clears throat> so those were pretty, pretty, um, pretty obvious uh, things that had to be done, but it took a lot of time. It, it took time to do it. And fortunately, we were able to come up pretty quickly with a fabulous staff, um, mixed backgrounds in terms of government, non-government, um, and, um, working as a team pretty quickly. Um, I think one of the first um, things that we had to do was to come to terms with 
having as our customer base all of the federal departments and agencies and the public. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big customer base and nobody knew who we were. So introducing ourselves and um, just trying to get people to start thinking about what OGIS was intended to be. I think the congressional support was very clear from the beginning. We want an impartial <coughs> ombudsman. We want an independent ombudsman. We want to see the FOIA process work better. It's got to work better. Um, so for us, for the staff, figuring out pretty quickly while we were trying to figure out um, where we were going to sit, um, also how we were going to present ourselves, um, and figuring out realistically what we could do. We had the statute, which was only, um, you know, a, a very, we thought, a very clear mandate um, for what to do, but how do we do it? How do we set our priorities? And where do we actually start? Um, with requests for dispute resolution services sitting um, on my desk the first day I walk in, we knew that that had to be our, um, sort of our first priority, and then you figure, you figure it out from there. One thing that was not in the statute that we did pretty quickly um, was to determine that dispute resolution skills training for FOIA professionals would be an important part of this because we were talking about a culture change. Um, so those were all the sort of obvious challenges. Um, I think the ones that surprised me, um, and Tom alluded to this, um, and, and that was really trying to garner support for this new entity. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say particularly, <clears throat> without the support of Senators Leahy and Corden um, in the Senate, and um, Krista's committee, um, Oversight, Government, and Reform, um, without the real strong um, public support of those creators of OGIS, um, I think it would have been um, even more difficult. Um, the open society, I mean, the open government um, civil society groups were very welcoming. Um, the interagency open government working group, very welcoming. But there were plenty of agencies and departments that um, sort of blew us off. And um, trying to establish relationships with them um, was, um, and still continues to be, a, a big, a big um, challenge. Um, Judge Grigsby mentioned the independence issue. Um, I think that was one of the more difficult um, challenges that we had to face. And um, in preparing for, for this talk this afternoon, I was sort of um, going back and looking at things. And um, um, the first annual report that we did, um, I can tell you right now without <clears throat> Um, Judge Grigsby's strong support behind the scenes, um, it, it, we would have never even had this report. Um, and of course, every year after that, we've had a report. But the change in the statute uh, in 2016 to make it crystal clear that um, Congress intended to hear from OGIS the unvarnished truth about what it saw in the way of FOIA improvement. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a really, um, I think, um, one of the best developments. There were so many things about the 2016 amendments that really made it just um, clear that dispute resolution 
has to be and now is an integral part of the way FOIA operates. The efficiency, the effectiveness, the reasonableness, the civility, all the words that you heard from um, Judge Howell and Senator Cornyn this morning um, is really um, those, those are what OGIS strives for, being impartial, being fair, um, being able to bring parties together to make the process work better. And um, I'm just delighted that we're here celebrating 10 years. Thank you. Uh, Krista, that sort of sets the stage for the 2016 amendments, but before you get to that, I have a, another question for you. Are you looking forward to being a federal judge? <laughs> <laughs> it occurred to me, uh, Judge Howell, of course, served on the congressional staff working on FOIA, Judge Grigsby, uh, Judge Ho on the Fifth Circuit uh, was on Senator Cornyn's staff uh, uh, during that time. And so um, I think you've got a bright future ahead of you on the federal bench. <laughs> but uh, Miriam was telling, uh, talking about the importance of the 2016 amendments and ta-da, take it away. That's where you came in. Uh, I, when we were exchanging emails earlier, you may have been the only uh, one on the receiving end who understood my little parenthetical because I sort of tried to capture what I wanted Krista to talk about by quoting her boss, uh, Congressman Cummins, who, who said, don't mistake a comma for a period. Uh, there's always more to do when you think you've come to the end of the sentence. And so um, that's, I think, we thought an awful lot was accomplished uh, with the original uh, law, Open Act, uh, Open Government Act, setting up uh, uh, OGIS, um, and I, I want to come back to some of the other issues about independence and location because NARA has been a great home, but it wasn't originally envisioned as a home. But that's not all, at least from your perspective, and you carried it one step further. So give us some background. There. Sure. So I, did, I do have one fun fact, which I uncovered as I was preparing for the panel because there's been a lot of life in the 10 years <laughs> that have happened and the years before that when OGIS was being envisioned. Um, and there was, I uncovered an email chain in my emails, um, which go back more years than I want to admit. And uh, there was a back and forth because the, the original legislative proposal as we were going back and forth between the Senate and the House had OGIS living in the Administrative Conference of the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. And there was concern that because uh, ACUS had not been funded and the, you know it was the, the subject of, of, of partisan um, you know, fights, I guess is a fair way to say it, because um, you know, former Speaker Gingrich you know, eviscerated it when he was in power. And uh, so there was concern that that wouldn't be the best home. And so there was a back and forth. And there was an email from, I won't name them because I didn't ask their permission, but someone on our staff who said, well, what about the National Archives? We have jurisdiction over the National Archives. And I thought, well, that's funny to find that and, you know, <laughs> to realize that's how that, you know, came out. And obviously I, there was a lot of vetting then after that and a lot of negotiation with the Senate over what would work. Um, but that was, I thought that was an, an, an interesting little gem to find. Um, but as we saw um, OGIS develop under the very strong leadership of Miriam, um, we, you know, were learning about the challenges that were coming about. Um, and I, I just want to take a minute to say that I, I think the success of OGIS um, is really in, in many ways due to the the leadership of Miriam in the beginning and how diplomatic but strong that you were in, in leading it. Um, you were impeccable in your testimony. You were impeccable in the, um, the force that you were bringing. It was um, a really, I think, a, a, a model for many of us in how to be effective in that you were, you were strong. You did not you know, take anything from anybody, but you did it in such a diplomatic way that it didn't come off as being, um, I think, too forceful. And I think we have a really bright future with the very strong leadership now of Alina. Um, it's really, I look forward to the way that OGIS is going to grow. But as we saw the challenges that OGIS was facing in those first years, um, we wanted on a bicameral, bipartisan basis to make really clear to agencies 
that OGIS was um, something that Congress supported and intended to act in the way that it was envisioned, and that was to be, first of all, you know, an ombuds and a mediator, but also to be able to evaluate the success or lack thereof of agencies and how they could um, use best practices and be nudged along when they were not um, working the way that they should. And the independence language that was put in the 2016 uh, amendment was really intended to, to shine a light and, and make clear that OGIS was not beholden to anyone, that they could come directly to Congress to report, to give budget information, appropriations needs, uh, and that language we actually just used in the House as a model for in the um, increased independence of the Office of Government Ethics. And hopefully that's something that we can work with the Senate in moving forward. Now that's, that's also a very interesting tidbit, that last one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that's uh, obviously extremely important as well. Uh, Elaine, getting back to you. Uh, uh, there's no question that uh, that OGIS is doing great things today. Uh, so, what's on your agenda for tomorrow, and what do you see as uh, challenges facing the future? I mean, obviously, the subject of uh, uh, Judge Howell mentioned resources that affects agencies across the board, um, and I think uh, OGIS could obviously always use additional resources to do its work, uh, and, uh, and you have a track record now to build on. So where do we go from here? Um, so I think it's fair to say that our future is very bright. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we're going to continue engaging in all the activities I've already talked about. But um, one thing that I think it's important to point out is that you know we are a non-exclusive alternative to litigation, um, but we also recognize litigation is still going to happen. Um, sometimes issues just need to go into litigation and district court judges um, need to hear the, the results but, uh, and, and resolve the disputes. But certainly, um, it's never been our goal to eliminate litigation entirely. There's always important legal issues that will need to be determined. But we are certainly there to provide uh, a dialogue and to facilitate conversations between requesters and agencies. Uh, we also want to very much continue our role as ombudsman. We want to provide information about the FOIA process. Um, I've talked about this uh, in the past, that I think a lot of requesters believe FOIA is like a big black box, and they enter it, and they don't know what's going to happen next. Um, so we do a lot of education um, and explanation of how the FOIA process works. Um, and it works a little bit differently at each agency, and we're certainly adapting and learning about that as, along the way. Um, but we're certainly hoping to continue to give guidance um, and, as I mentioned earlier, advisory opinions is high on our list. Um, the Ombuds Observer that we rolled out last year, we're very excited about, was in conjunction with an immigration forum that we sponsored um, here in McGowan Theater. Uh, we are very excited to bring together agency personnel from um, all the different immigration related uh, agencies uh, and talk about how to get access to those kinds of records, which is a very important topic. Um, and we issued the Ombuds Observer as a way to explain to the general public how to get access to uh, records from the Customs Border Protection or the um, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, again, some of those uh, agencies are a little bit mysterious to navigate, and our role is to try to shed light on how to navigate most efficiently. Krista, do you have a wish list going forward? Have you uh, thought about what your I mean, I know that you're having hearings uh, in two days on Wednesday, uh, FOIA oversight, and uh, perhaps uh, after that you'll see some additional areas that will need some closer and more immediate attention, uh, but you follow this area very closely. You and I have been on probably a half dozen panels <laughs> together in the last decade, so what's next uh, from your perspective? So one of the most uh, immediate concerns is the proposed rulemaking from the Department of the Interior that came out in December. Chairman Cummings sent a letter last week with Senator Leahy's, Senator Leahy, Senator Grassley, and Senator Cornyn, and it was a great, um, I think, strong bipartisan 
message that the members are really concerned about this proposed rule. So that's one of the most immediate things that needs to be addressed, and that's one of the issues that will be addressed uh, at Wednesday's hearing. The Overs Oversight Committee will have a hearing on Wednesday at 9.30 a.m., uh, and, the, and the witnesses will include DOJ, EPA, and the Department of the Interior. And what do you expect? Uh, there's been some, I guess, uh, uh, back and forth within the community about uh, the fact that you're only having government witnesses, but I guess uh, for each of those, this is likely to be uh, n not a fun opportunity for them to sit in the chair and be grilled by the uh, oversight committee. Uh, do you want to give us a little uh, preview of anything? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's, I, th I think if you look at Chairman Cummings' letters from the last two years, it'll give you a little bit of a preview of uh, where the questions might be headed. But that's, you know, I think the way uh, Chairman Cummings is approaching FOIA, but also other transparency and records issues, is that we're not looking to have just this one hearing during Sunshine Week and that be the end of the oversight. And so I think there, you know, this this hearing should not be mistaken for the end of end of the message. So there will be plenty of opportunity for other perspectives. But one of the uh, reasons that we chose in this case to go with a government-only panel is that when you have a very long hearing with multiple panels, there are some times that that's the right thing to do, but sometimes you lose the message by the time you get to the second panel. And so sometimes having a very, you know, a sharper, uh, more e efficient questioning <laughs> period can work out better. And then, you know, we can always have other, um, other hearings and other opportunities uh, for um, information to come out. Well, and I think the oversight function, which, uh, again, I, uh, Judge Grigsby is familiar with, uh, as, as was I on the Hill, uh, it has been very important in this area because agencies, you can't sue them all. Uh, and a lot of the issues are uh, uh, procedural. Uh, and so uh, it requires a congressional uh, uh, effort. I remember Senator Leahy actually putting some funds in the State Department budget to address the backlog. Were you, were you involved in that one, too? Not directly. Okay, but I mean, it was a, not direct, <laughs> indirectly. Uh, but that was a very important for clearing up their backlog. Uh, Miriam, uh, in the early, uh, you've heard Alina talk about advisory opinions, uh, and uh, with some pride uh, that they finally uh, issued one last year and intend to look towards the opportunity to issue others. My recollection is in the early years, although you had authority to issue advisory opinions, that there was a, a hesitation on the part of OGIS management uh, to uh, perhaps draw a line as an adversary to the agencies while trying at the same time to uh, pull them in to a collaborative dispute resolution. Uh, give us a, a little more of a feeling for how that played out and, and do you have the, are, are you okay now with uh, oh, just moving into the advisory opinion business? Uh, uh, yes, I think, I think the change in the language in the 2016 amendments um, took care of um, our concern. The language um, in the 2007 um, amendments were, it was written in such a way that um, we would almost, OGIS would almost be issuing advisory opinions after a mediation had failed to resolve a dispute, which, in, which seemed like it was calling for an opinion about what had gone on. That's really inconsistent with the role of the mediator. The mediator is bringing together the parties to help them come up with a solution. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But then to have that impartial mediator opining about what did or didn't go um, well with the mediation and opining on the issues um, felt like it was not really quite, um, it, there was, it just wasn't the right thing for a mediator to be doing. The change in the law though, allows OGIS at its discretion to issue advisory opinions, 
not about specific cases, but rather what it, what it sees and the mediation process, the dispute resolution process puts OGIS in a perfect position to do that because you are observing, you're talking to lots of different agencies, you're talking lot to lots of different FOIA requesters. And it really, um, I really think that the change um, took care of that. Uh, Lydia, you're sitting on a court now with a very complex jurisdiction of tax cases, takings, public contracts, IP. Are you glad not to have freedom of information <laughs> cases? Well, it's funny. We don't have freedom of information cases, but I can tell you FOIA comes up quite a bit in my cases. It's often a tool that's used by the litigants to get information uh, to help proceed in government contract disputes in particular. Um, so I continue to appreciate the value of FOIA, and I can tell you people who bring cases in my court appreciate the value. So we see it from that perspective. And as uh, Chief Judge Howell mentioned earlier, the courts also have to weigh a balance about openness as well. Uh, the default is openness, but we also are faced with issues about when to keep information secret, if it's a trade secret, for example, and how to balance those issues and opinions. So it's still very much a part of my work in a way. Now, Krista mentioned the uh, early uh, issue of uh, institutional independence, and I know that's something that, that you mentioned as well and we're very concerned about. And, uh, I'd, I, I, I had forgotten that ACUS wasn't in ex existence at the time, uh, had been defunded. Um, uh, I, I think, if memory serves me, uh, the National Archives did not open its arms initially to welcome the um, uh, placement of OGIS uh, here. Uh, and uh, I, it, like an orphan wandering the streets, we had a great idea. And <laughs> but we were having trouble finding a home for it. Um, you satisfied with where it landed? Uh, is, this, is this the right place? I mentioned earlier that uh, at least under the current archivist and general counsel, uh, OGIS has received uh, uh, the uh, funding, uh, office spaces now, uh, uh, authority, support on legislative agenda. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, so far, so good. Uh, are you, do you see the bright future as well? I do. I think um, it certainly um, would be helpful if the National Archives received more funding as well as um, OGIS specifically. And I think I that's... I see David <laughs> sitting over there going like this. <laughs> I know where I'm sitting, <laughs> but I mean, it really, it truly is something that uh, Chairman Cummings and our members really um, believe in is supporting the National Archives, and there are a lot of missions that have to deal with not just records, but increasing um, public, you know, access to information, and OGIS is, is one of those, and OGIS, um, you know, very much needs continued, um, you know, uh, consistent access to resources, you know, so that it isn't just this uh, roller coaster of, you know, can hire a couple people, then then you lose them, hire a couple, you know, so I think that's something that, um, I think the, the archives has been um, a, a very good home in that it's been, uh, as far as we've been able to see on the congressional side, very supportive of um, the mission of OGIS and not, um, you know, supporting you know the the resources that OGIS has but I think it's up to Congress to ensure that OGIS and the archives has have the resources to continue a consistent level of funding so uh, all is pretty bright but there are a couple of dark spots if I recollect uh, Alina for example uh, OGIS does not have the ability to get access to the actual documents uh, in many cases because of uh, the agencies don't share them and uh, there are privacy act issues that you don't get a agencies have refused to give sort of blanket waivers there that may be a, while we have uh, Krista in between us I'm gonna let you uh, give you a little uh, free reign to uh, to suggest uh, without having to go through the general counsel or archivist uh, a, a legislative uh, agenda 
<laughs> I don't have to anymore. I can just pick up the phone and talk to Krista anytime. Um, well, certainly we did um, go up to the Hill last year and we had a bill that didn't get very far um, on the issue of um, certain agencies not having SWARNs um, and allowing us the possibility of being able to talk to them about individual cases. Um, we, uh, it had an unfortunate name. I think that didn't help. It was called the OGIS Empowerment Act, which just did not sound really <laughs> all that palatable, and I think it's scared to many people. But um, I think it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, we're certainly working our way around it. I mean, it's funny because we've had um, one agency in particular has come knocking on our door now several times in the last um, several weeks and months, and we've just said to them. If you guys could just get a sworn together, we would be able to talk to you about. Wait, you're referring to sworn. I mean, I'm sorry, system of records notice. Thank that you. sorry, <laughs> sorry, no acronyms in the federal government. That would allow us to speak more freely about individual requests. So all we can do with certain agencies um, is just give them general advice. Um, because the other thing we have to remember is we're there to serve the requester community as well as agencies. So everyone is our customer. We're happy to facilitate conversations. Agencies come to us and they ask us for help with uh, particularly vexatious requests that they're getting in um, or issues that they're constantly seeing and they need um, just some perspective from us on and we're always happy to do that as well. So um, I would say that's, you know, that's certainly an issue that we're, we continue to grapple with and it's fair to say that. Good, well, I, I, I suspect you've just gotten on the House Oversight Committee's agenda for uh, the uh, coming Congress in terms Sure, of but with a different title of, of a bill that we'll, is we'll a little work, more... Um, we'll work on that. Yeah. We'll work on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, Tom, let me just mention that the whole, the issue of um, the Privacy Act um, being, being a barrier to um, full OGIS assistance is something that was identified right in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, a solution to that would be, would be great. Okay, we're uh, nearing the, uh, the end, and I, I don't know if we, if, if people have, are dying to ask questions, we do have a couple of minutes. Otherwise, I'm just gonna go down and ask our panelists for a, a, a last minute. Do, uh, there's a question, there's some microphones. Uh, just to, Sure. Patrice asked the question, can someone explain the Privacy Act issue? Uh, Alina, well, come on. Well, the three of us aren't going to do it, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> the Privacy Act of, of 1974 um, certainly um, appropriately restricts the government's sharing of its records on individuals, not only with the public, but between agencies. So that's, that's sort of the basic um, problem. What we ran into early on and still remains a problem is if an agency has not published in its routine uses um, um, that it is going to a, a note, essentially a notice to the public that it is going to be sharing its records with OGIS, um, then the Privacy Act is as much a prohibition on sharing records about an individual's FOIA request with that agency as much as it would be a prohibition on the agency um, sharing that information with any member of the public. Um, so if you have to go agency by agency, department by department to get them to issue um, a, a, a notice saying that they're going to do this, then they can't share. The most obvious problem is not when a requester comes to OGIS and says, would you work on my case, my FOIA request with agency X, but rather when Agency X comes to OGIS and says, we have a problem with this requester and this particular request, can you help us? So 
when the request is coming from the agency to OGIS, we can't really look at those records. OGIS cannot look at those records. Um, I just also want to add, there is a little bit of uh, some bright news here. Um, 13 out of 15 cabinet level agencies have now uh, amended their, their SORNs in order to allow us to go chat with them and um, on some independent agencies, but we still kind of have a long way to go. We're probably less than 50%. Mm -hmm. That's a good agenda. Uh, next question, Jason. Okay, I have two questions. One is for Mary and Alina. Is, could you talk about the relationship between OGIS and the Office of Information Policy at DOJ, where there are issues that have arisen in the last 10 years and uh, what the future may be? And the second question is for Alina about cues at OGIS and what uh, has arisen, what steps are you taking to eliminate the time lag um, that may exist when requesters ask OGIS to uh, have assistance? Uh, Alina, why don't you answer the second question yeah. and Miriam, you answer the first question because I don't want to interrupt governmental uh, tensions to raise her <laughs> ugly head at this table this afternoon. Um, so to answer Jason's second question, and we talk about this in our annual report this year, we are proud of the fact that we are um, continuing to close the simple requests that come in, those that, doesn't, that do not necessarily require us to go and talk to the agency. We can answer questions and resolve issues that are brought up by the requester uh, on our own. Um, but we do have um, a growing backlog of requests that we deem complex. Um, those are the ones that actually require uh, back and forth dialogue. Um, I like to call it shuttle diplomacy, but that's really what we do uh, between and among the requester, the agency, and, and OGIS staff. Um, and we're definitely not proud of the fact that some of those complex cases are getting pretty old. They're aging in our backlog um, over 90 days, um, probably over 180 days, I dare say, at this point. And we're very much committed to trying to uh, reduce that backlog and um, we're doing the best we can with the resources that we have, if I can use the R word. Um, so um, we could have a whole nother session on, <laughs> on the question that Jason asked, um, but I'll, I will just say I, I think um, no one who's ever worked in, um, in government is surprised to find that when um, an agency or an office has had um, pretty much the whole responsibility for an area and then there's a new kid on the block, um, it can cause um, a lot of tension, um, particularly when there's overlapping responsibility, uh, for example, with reviewing compliance by agencies. So sorting out who does what and ensuring that OGIS um, had, um, had indeed the responsibility and the authority that Congress had given to OGIS to, to not only play in this um, field, but to um, really make a serious uh, contribution to improving FOIA um, was probably one of the more um, surprising things to me um, when I first came in because I guess I thought the statute was really clear <laughs> um, and yet there was an awful lot of resistance um, not just from DOJ but from some other agencies as well who just didn't understand what OGIS was doing, why it was in their business and um, I, I think I think that has changed um, a great deal um, because agencies really um, have come to understand that OGIS is there to help, really to help. Um, that's its mission. Um, and let me just add one more thing about um, the discussion, the little bit of discussion about where OGIS would be put. Um, I really do think it was um, a saving grace that OGIS was placed at um, the National Archives. Um, the, being in an agency whose, <laughs> whose mission is to provide access to government records, that's the mission, um, gives a really uh, a great 
a great home for OGIS. Um, and David Ferriero and Gary Stern, um, particularly, I'll call out for having um, really from the beginning um, all the all the support one would want. We are. We have a few seconds left, but you only get one question, Alex, okay. not three. Well, then I'll take the one question. Um, the uh, FOIA improvement, uh, sorry, not FOIA improvement. The uh, the bill in question, uh, the Empowerment Act, was the shortest bill I think I saw in the last Congress. It just had one line. It would amend one part of the U.S. Code that say each agency shall make any record available to OGIS for the purposes of carrying out the subsection upon request of the director, which goes to a very specific question. Are there still problems that OGIS is encountering in speaking to the agencies where they are not making available the records in question to you all to do mediation? And if so, would it be appropriate for Congress to give you further powers, much in the same way we've seen inspectors general be further empowered to get records? Because what I've heard from the requester community is that they still don't, well, first, know that you exist in many cases, and second, um, see going to mediation as an effective alternative um, to get the records as opposed to going to see the judge where they can be compelled. Um, and seeing as how uh, Congress is listening, um, what are the tools that you need to be able to empower requesters more effectively? Um, and I won't ask the second question since you limited it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, let me take a quick stab at it because, as I've said before, uh, I was uh, involved 20 years ago in trying to get an independent uh, agency in the U.S. government to try to take the pressure off of going to court and help requesters resolve disputes. Uh, and so I would personally be in favor of additional authority in OGIS to be able to have access to the records that it needs to. Uh, I, I, I simply, I suppose, uh, w with some trepidation, I say disagree with uh, uh, Chief Judge Howell on the subject of in-camera inspection uh, because I think that uh, uh, she said the system uh, otherwise isn't transparent. And I guess my view is when, o when only one side has access to the records, in dispute, that's not a very transparent system, but when one side and the judge does, that's at least a little more transparent. And so I think that OGIS, uh, uh, as a, uh, even, a even a mediator, uh, should have that authority to look at the record. And I would I guess I, I would go the next step, uh, and Alina, you don't have to comment on this, but I mean, I would, uh, I, I would move towards the more adjudicative function uh, ultimately giving OGIS some authority in some areas to um, issue opinions in specific disputes, even though I understand that that may run afoul of the traditional ADR. But I think uh, the more, the, the future of uh, efficient administration of the Freedom of Information Act uh, relies on a, uh, an empowered OGIS, uh, my personal view. Um, so Alex is up there again, but I, I actually do want to just comment on this because one of the uh, many things that Miriam counseled me to do uh, was to become part of the international community. And my first opportunity to go and um, attend my first uh, information commissioner's conference was in 2017. And I met a number of information commissioners from all over the world and sat down and talked with many of them about how their programs work. and. Um, some of them actually have the very program that you know we're discussing now, and but they also have a cadre of 40 attorneys on their staff, who are reviewing the documents that the agency is uh, is withholding. So they're actually getting to look underneath the redactions, and then they're issuing opinions along the lines of what we're talking about. But it's a very different kind of system, um, and so whether you know that I don't think that was the initial contemplation for OJAS. I think it. It really kind of turns it into a slightly different um, animal. Um, so I think it, you know, it certainly deserves discussion, uh, but I think it also requires a lot more resources and a, a different staffing. One step at a time. Yes. Well, I want to thank our panelists today for enlightening discussion. Yes, thank you.
Thanks, thanks again to uh, the National Archives, the Archivist, General Counsel, OGIS Director uh, for uh, uh, making this uh, program possible, and I look forward to coming back and celebrating the 20th anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, and I just want to let everyone know we're going to take a 15-minute break um, before we move on to our exciting second half of our program. Uh, during the break, feel free to visit our Charters Cafe located on this level, uh, but no food or drink back in the auditorium. Uh, there are restrooms directly outside of the theater and another set downstairs near the cafe. And please come back at, if possible, 3.40 would be great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. We are well. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, most everyone is back. Um, at this time, we have our next panel coming up and getting settled in. Um, and uh, I'm excited to, to introduce this great panel. Um, and I gave my longtime former colleague and friend, Jason Barron, um, carte blanche on how to structure and approach this next panel as the moderator. We'll see if that was a mistake. <laughs> uh, but seriously, anything related to records management is in no better hands than Jason's. Uh, records management issues have been near and dear to Jason's heart for many years, from the days we worked together at Department of Justice to now, where he has become an internationally recognized speaker and author on the preservation of electronic documents. The rest of his bio is included in the handout. Joining Jason in this afternoon's panel is Jonathan Redgrave, who has extensive experience in the area of information law, including electronic discovery, records and information management, and data protection and privacy issues. Jonathan speaks around the world on topics including cross-border discovery, information governance, privacy, data security, and emerging technologies. We look forward to his insights on the future of electronic record keeping. I'm also very pleased to welcome my colleague, Lawrence Brewer, the Chief Records Officer for the U.S. Government. Uh, with that daunting title, Lawrence leads records management throughout the government with an emphasis on electronic records. He provides overall guidance and direction to federal agencies on all aspects of records information management, including overseeing scheduling and appraisal of federal records, the development of records management regulations and guidance, and evaluating effectiveness of records management programs in federal agencies. And last, but certainly not least, I am happy to welcome our NARA colleague, Courtney Anderson. Courtney serves as the project lead for the Federal Electronic Records Modernization Initiative, FERMI. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Which is NARA's effort to develop a comprehensive government-wide strategy for procuring records management services and solutions. And she probably has the clearest crystal ball, so I'm excited about that. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it over to Jason and his crystal ball and a PowerPoint. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Selena. It's a delight. I, I feel very honored to come back to um, the National Archives, where I had a dream job for 13 years as Director of Litigation. And um, I have a very esteemed panel with me, people who I have tremendous respect for. I consider Lawrence Brewer to be the consummate public servant as Chief Records Officer of the United States. I've Can known you John... me to return the favor? Uh, no. Uh, I've, uh, uh, Jonathan Redgrave is a visionary um, as an e-discovery lawyer and someone who uh, started... Um, a working group at the Sedona Conference thinking about e-discovery and electronic records uh, a while back in the 2000s. And he and I have worked closely together on lots of projects. And Courtney um, is a rising star at the National Archives, who I've had the pleasure to meet and who you will hear from. So I'm absolutely delighted for the panel. Let me uh, throw out one question first. Um, and then we'll, let's look back first, and then we'll go forward. Uh, Jonathan, um, in your uh, career as a uh, trial lawyer, as an e-discovery lawyer, and as a thought leader uh, in the legal space, um, how have you seen the world change in terms of the kind of records that lawyers have to deal with in your career? So we're going to look back first before we go into the future. So go ahead, Jonathan. Well, looking backwards, uh, it's amazing to think even just back to the 1980s. Obviously, you had computers and data, and it had been around for decades and decades by that time even, but really the office workspace where most people 
that worked in an office environment, whether you're in private enterprise or in the government, the real interaction with the personal computer that was made possible in the early 1980s and then just kind of transformed thereafter the entire business space. In the world of private enterprise, of course, uh, you had a lot of seismic changes in terms of the role of people in the workspace. Secretaries, for instance, in, in private enterprise really started changing the people that used to be the custodians, the people that really made sure things got filed and got filed in the right place when they were paper. They disappeared over the course of the next 20 years. And as a result, uh, combine that with computers and computers in the workspace of the office, uh, you had a lot more information that was being generated at warp speed as time went by. And so really, the last, gee, 30 years has seen a, a real transformation in terms of what's been generated and what's been kept. Now, in terms of the law and what lawyers do in the courtroom and what courts do, Lawyers are, are today trying to use the word innovation a lot, but they're not the most innovative group. And in fact, lawyers kind of stand by the status quo. They like Latin phrases too. Um, they stand by the status quo and just kind of stay there and, and they don't really move off of it much. And really, even getting courts to understand and, and adopt to a world in which you've got emojis rather than words, you've got objects rather than text, uh, it's kind of tough. And even getting to a world where you start thinking about AI and really getting into computers, finding things much better than people, courts and lawyers have had a little bit of a challenge with that. So I think uh, there's a lot that has changed in the 30 years in terms of both the workspace and then the reality of computers and technology and what it means for records and record keeping and how that gets into the court in terms of evidence. Uh, it's really been seismic and I think there's a tremendous opportunity for additional change both with the laws and the way in which courts deal with the records and deal with evidence that comes in, whether or not it's classified as a record. Um, so I've always talked to uh, law students in the last decade about what a tremendous potential there is for change and, and to be really involved. And I think what's exciting about the National Archives, and I've been very blessed to have a lot of interaction with people here over the years, um, just the forward-thinking nature in terms of what the law should be and, and how uh, the agency really you know, thinks about how to interact with all the other agencies out there. The administration, NARA, interacts with all the agencies out there to try and figure out how are we gonna deal with this 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 100 years from now. That kind of visionary um, thinking is something, again, as I said, lawyers may not be accused of too often, but uh, I really get into it and I think it's really the right thing. So this is a, a great thing. And then even looking at from the Freedom of Information Act, I've got a lot of experience with FOIA and then also state equivalents. Um, and it's critical, just critical. So I'm, I'm just pleased to be here um, for this 10th anniversary. Courtney, you have less time in your career than the rest of us, but tell us how life has changed in records uh, world for you. Well, I actually have technically about 20 years of experience because my first job in high school, um, my summer job was actually filing records and preparing them for destruction for my mom's financial advising <laughs> company, so I, I have a bit of experience. But I've really been in the field since about the, um, the mid-2000s. And I think um, when I first came into the field, it was really you saw the transition from paper to electronic. And um, a lot of agencies were taking the approach of using, um, of purchasing like a big records management application to house all of their records. And it was sort of, they were still using the same paper processes, but for electronic records. So for example, it was a lot of clicking and filing for the end user. They would have to, you know, they no longer had secretaries like they used to. They were doing their own electronic filing that looked very similar to paper. So I think um, over the past 15 years or so, I've seen a lot more um, automation. Um, there, you know, the move to, to the cloud, to agencies that are using um, cloud repositories, so they aren't actually housing their data and records anymore. They're being um, stored by a company or even another agency if they're using a shared service. And so I think it's, we're starting to see now that we're managing electronic records more like their electronic records, not like paper. So it's more about applying the metadata to those records um, and being able to capture them automatically. Um, I've seen a lot of vendors, they've made great strides with being able to automatically capture vendors. So I think that's been the big change in the past 15 years that I've been in the field. And Lawrence, you have a quarter century of experience. So what is your 
I mean, that timeline, how give has or, the world give changed? Give or take, don't yeah. date me too much. So first I want to say uh, thank you, Alina. I'm, I'm very glad to be spending happy hour here with you celebrating OGIS. So I look back and um, to me, what strikes me, and it's not, I know it's not universally true for all agencies, but I feel like as records managers, I won't speak for the FOIA community, but we're out of the basement. So for me, I mean that figuratively, but also literally, because I go back to the beginnings of my records management career, and I was working at the old EPA building, I don't know if some of you remember it, over at the Southwest Waterfront. It was not a very nice building. We were not only in the basement, but in the basement underneath the parking garage. So it was, I mean, you can just imagine the carbon monoxide, the sick building syndrome. And we were the records management trolls that were in the basement, no disrespect to trolls of any kind. <laughs> but it was, it was a, a totally different environment getting serious now in terms of the profile of records management. And I think what we have done over the last several years through the work that we've done with the records management directive, with a presidential memorandum, with our own strategic plan and the leadership that the archivist has given to this agency and empowered us to work with other agencies is we've really seen the professionalization of the discipline. So as part of the directive, we created a new job series for records managers with very specific skills um, that give them a path um, that we never had before. We, it, you basically, we figured it out on our own in terms of what we thought we needed to provide as a service for agencies. Um, so, you know, that, that all kind of has, you know, been on that path as we've, you know, gone forward, um, working with the administration and now, you know, seeing the support that we've gotten from the director, from a memo, from this administration where we see in the current government reform plan a cross-agency um, goal for uh, the transition uh, to fully electronic government, something we never even would have considered you know, many, many years ago. I won't even say how many. Um, so for me, it's been very gratifying to see the kinds of, of support in the records management community going forward and, and trying and reaching very senior positions so that you know, we have representation with the CIOs and um, other senior C-suite um, officials within agencies and that, that, that voice for records management is now coming through louder and clearer than it did 20 or so years ago. Uh, for me, I, I started in government in 1980 at HHS and then went to the Justice Department and then um, in 2000 came to NARA. And for a very long time, I felt from a records management perspective, it was like Groundhog Day uh, in the movie um, where uh, I woke up every morning and there was still a print-to-paper um, mentality uh, throughout the government um, with respect to its record keeping. I was very heartened during my time at the National Archives to uh, be able to work with the archivist and with Gary Stern to uh, be part of an effort, uh, the Managing Government Records Directive, to turn a corner on that and to uh, put down some markers for 2016 for email and 2019 for permanent record accessioning going forward in the future. And so um, I saw a sea change. I saw an inflection point um, where there really w um, had been progress uh, from where I, I was sitting at HHS in the 1980s and at Justice in the 1990s. Now, um, I must say, uh, with my panelist's indulgence, um, and with the indulgence of Alina and with everyone, I, I couldn't help myself um, in approaching this panel. And, and the fact is that we all should have some humility uh, with respect to our crystal ball predictions. And so I put together some PowerPoints that show how wrong people are in making predictions uh, as a setup for what we're now going to do, which is to then predict the future of record keeping. So uh, Jonathan mentioned 100 years in the future. Um, about 100 years ago, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Michael Crichton predicted that, well, 100 years ago in 1900, one of the issues that were concerning people was horse pollution. Um, that is, that there'd be so many people and so many, the need for horses in cities that there'd be tremendous problems. So that's one prediction that had gone awry because of technology, namely the automobile. Some of the worst predictions of all time, um, 
let's look at these. Um, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers, Thomas Watson said in 1943. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, I'll read it off this slide here. The uh, television wouldn't have any market. Um, and people will soon grow tired of it. Uh, let's get the, uh, the person who said that, Daryl Zadig, in 1946. Um, then uh, the head of Digital Equipment Corporation said there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Um, that was in 1977. And my favorite prediction, which went a little awry, is that nuclear-powered vacuum cleaners will probably be a reality within 10 years. Um, that was said in 1955. So we take uh, predictions with a grain of salt. Now, in my life, I don't know, uh, uh, let me ask the archivist. Were you at the World's Fair in 64? Yes. Yep, and, and I was. And um, I don't know who else is old enough here <laughs> oh, uh, to be here. I, I, was, I was not there. Uh, yeah, uh, I, yeah I, uh, uh, very few in the audience there. But um, the World's Fair of 64, when I was eight years old, promised a future world where cars would look like this, where cars would float over highways in the 1980s, where there'd be underwater cities. Um, and this was coming in just a decade or two or three um, in the 64 World's Fair, and that we'd be colonizing the moon by 2000. And so with all of that said, um, those predictions haven't come to pass. There's a lot of things that have come to pass, which is especially the internet and the online world that we're in. Um, if we're thinking about FOIA from 1966, there's certainly been changes in technology, uh, and it affects both the record-keeping process and the FOIA process, uh, signal event being the e-FOIA of 1996. So we have been moving, uh, moving from a world of the archives here and in records management throughout the government of a world of paper and boxes and federal record centers that have paper and boxes to um, a world of, of all digital. Uh, essentially that uh, email and every kind of electronic object stored on computers and um, potentially affecting the operations of the National Archives in the future as well as uh, all government agencies. So this is the world we have transitioned to that we're entering and I will make the controversial point here. Uh, this was not my headline, it was I grabbed it from some uh, publication in the last week. We can talk about this because I, I there may be a fair a disagreement among panelists is how awful we are at, at records management or inf information management. Um, the fact is I know on email until capstone, until uh, automated records management took hold at, in light of the Managing Government Records Directive of 2016 and the capstone policy that NARA put forward, um, I think uh, there are compliance issues throughout government and now there is a, a future of archiving uh, email records in repositories in hundreds of agencies and the FOIA implications of that still are to be rolled out and may affect FOIA very dramatically in the next 10 years. So with all of that, that's all of my preface on my slides uh, before we start imagining the records management world of the future. And I'm going to turn to Lawrence. Um, to, uh, to sort of start us off on government record keeping practices and what changes are in store. And I guess the very first thing to talk about is the strategic plan since it gets us part of the way towards the 10 year interval we're talking about. So Lawrence, go right ahead. Well, we are in the National Archives, so we have to look back before we can go forward. So um, the strategic plan is a really foundational piece for all of us here in the archives and in, in the records management community. And I think our sister community with FOIA see a lot of, of things that are, are critical to them, especially in goal one, make access happen. But I want to focus from the records management perspective, the, the path that we have been on, and we've already uh, mentioned a, a number of things with uh, the, the presidential memorandum in 2011 the Managing Government Records Directive, um, which was co-issued with OMB in uh, 2012, um, and, and the key goals in there, 2016 for email, and then 2019, this year, is the year for managing permanent electronic records electronically. So I think the, the point to emphasize is the, the path that we have been on has been a path where we're constantly pushing ourselves and our, um, our agencies, our, our uh, the people that we work with forward. And it's really been a path that's been more evolutionary than revolutionary. We've built upon every success that we've had. 
And so now we're able to say that um, we have a goal in 2022 where the National Archives won't accept any paper records. So um, what originally what came first in focusing on email in 2016, it was smaller in scope. It was just email. Let's solve the email problem. To get to 2019, it's solve all permanent electronic records. Let's see if we can't create within agencies the, the momentum where they can uh, establish the policies, the systems, ways to provide access and ultimately disposition for those kinds of records electronically. So um, what we tried to solve, first, born digital. So if a record was created electronically, it had to stay that way. But that left out a lot of the legacy records, which we're trying to deal with now with the 2022 goal, where we recognize that there's a lot of uh, information, a lot of records out there that are in paper, but we don't want to take in any more paper. We want to, we want to create a way where we can deal with the born digital and the not born digital, and then only deal with electrons going forward. So um, that's sort of where we have been in terms of like driving an agenda where we can get to this goal of fully electronic government where we know along the way we have to um, issue policies, we have to issue standards, we have to provide the tools. And as you'll hear from Courtney later, it's critical you work with the private sector and the vendor community to build that um, uh, the demand and or the supply and the demand chain um, around those kinds of tools so that we can actually all work this way. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of been our goal in, in sort of how we want to move forward and making sure that we um, address the, the, the key processes and, and challenges within the agencies to make sure that we can realize that goal of fully electronic government. And uh, so at our prep call when we, we chatted about this, I was hesitant to ask you to commit on the record here, a video record of beyond 2022. but. Um, whether, there, whether or not there are formal plans that NARA has, that beyond its strategic plan, um, what do you see as changes in the workplace, changes at agencies beyond 2022 in terms of records management? What, what is the rest of the decade of the 2020s going to look like? Well, first, I'm not going to commit the agency to anything without talking to the archivist first. Well, he's so. right here, so, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not going to put yeah. him on the spot. I mean, I think, um, and we'll talk about some of these things later you know, as we get into the discussion is like, what is, what is the role of the records manager in the future and, and what does the domain of records management actually look like? So you have to be able to answer those questions. But I think in looking at that evolutionary path in getting to fully electronic government, I think the things that we really need and should be focusing on is how do we, how do we work with the private sector to to get the tools that will allow agencies to manage records electronically and make sure that they are, are able to provide disposition either um, for temporary records or for the permanent records that are gonna come to us. So to do that, the other piece of that is the people side. So you, you, you have to solve the technology side, but there, there are a lot of uh, records managers and agencies that really need the, the skills to be able to work in this kind of an environment. And one of the things that I know we are working on in our training program and listening to agencies about what their needs are is how do we continue to professionalize the records management profession to a point where they have the skills, abilities, and knowledge that will allow their agencies to be successful in meeting these goals. Good. So uh, why don't we... Uh, go to Courtney now, and since you are the lead on Fermi, why don't you explain Fermi to the crowd and um, what the goal, what the mission of Fermi is? Sure. So we, um, so when we started on um, this path of trying to help agencies achieve the the targets in the Managing Government Records Directive, we went around and talked to agencies, um, records officers, to hear what they needed. And what we kept hearing from them is that Nara, you do a good job of telling agencies what they need to do to manage their electronic records, but what they really need is the how. They need more practical tools and um, ways to actually manage their records, how to actually go out and, 
and review and purchase some of these tools that are provided by um, industry. So we came up with the Federal Electronic Records Modernization Initiative, or Fermi, not to be confused with the, the Italian physicist. Um, so, um, and what we did is we started, um, like I said, we talked to a number of stakeholders. We talked with OMB to see where we could get started on this. Um, we wanted to see, the two goals really for Fermi is to um, help agencies more easily obtain electronic records management services and solutions by helping to simplify the procurement and acquisition process. We heard a lot from agencies that even if they did get some resources, um, the, the acquisition process was was um, a big obstacle. Writing requirements, writing the statement of work to actually go out and purchase these tools. So we wanted to work with um, partners in the government that could help us with that. And that sent us to the General Services Administration. And we've partnered with two different groups at GSA. The first is the Office of Shared Solutions and Performance Improvement. And this is the group that was set up in October of 2015 at um, GSA to help standardize shared services throughout the federal government. And if you're not familiar with shared services, it's basically um, different services that are offered um, that multiple agencies use. So a good example is payroll. There are about three or four different payroll services offered by agencies um, that many agencies can use, like the National Finance Center is an example. There's also financial management systems that lots of agencies use um, throughout the government and they pay a service to that, pay a fee to that um, particular agency to use that, that service. So at, up to that point, they had not been standardized. So what um, GSA worked to do is to, to have a business standards council with standard leads for each of the different big service areas. So for example, there's um, Treasury is the standard lead for financial management services. OPM, the Office of um, Personnel Management, is the standard lead for um, HR. And so all these big service areas have a standard lead. And they are working to actually write standards um, for these shared services. And the goal is to actually have commercial providers provide the services, get agencies out of managing these services, and have them just manage the contracts, and then have commercial providers provide these services. So we worked with the Office of Shared Solutions and Performance Improvement and became the standard lead for electronic records management. We saw that there are records in all of these different shared services, financial management records, HR records, obviously, travel records. There's a grants um, shared service, and that you know there's obviously records with grants. So we wanted to make sure that our records management requirements were included in each of these shared services standards. So we started working on our own standard. Um, they're calling it the Federal Integrated Business Framework. And this identifies all the key functions activities and business capabilities for each of these um, shared services across the federal government. So we have been working on products to help reach these, these goals and to, to create these standards. So the first product that we came up with is what we call the Universal Electronic Records Management Requirements. And we came up with this because after talking with agency records officers, they said they, they really needed help writing these requirements as they were going out to either write a statement of work if they were going out to buy an electronic records management service or solution, or sometimes you know their IT department would come to them and say, we're about to purchase a system that's going to house records. What are your required requirements for records management? What do we need to do to manage the records in this system? So we put these requirements together so agencies can use them as a starting point when they're drafting their own requirements. And what we actually did is we combed through all of our regulations, our guidance documents, the Federal Records Act, as well as international standards, and put them into one big spreadsheet. And they're divided by the life cycle of the record, um, so they're e easily searchable and, and they can sort them, and so agencies can use these um, as they're drafting and tailor them to meet their, their own specific agency requirements. So the next piece of this, this whole journey with Fermi is after working with GSA's Office of Shared Solutions and Performance Improvement, we started working with GSA's Federal Acquisition Services in their multiple award schedules. And we talked to, and this is the group um, that they offer um, contract vehicles for agencies to use 
um, so for a particular function so that they can actually, vendors can submit proposals to be listed underneath the schedule and then agencies can submit solicitations under a pre-vetted list of vendors. So we ended up, after talking with a bunch of different groups, um, working with what is called the Schedule 36 team. And this is the team that runs, that holds these contracts for office management. And they had had for many years a um, contract or special item number, as they call it, for records management. Um, and it had been used you know, by agencies for several years. Um, but it was basically um, focused on physical records, like paper storage, paper destruction, filing, that sort of thing. We wanted to update it to include more electronic records management. So what we ended up doing, working with um, our partners at GSA, is creating a new special item number specifically for electronic records management. And we actually incorporated the universal ERM requirements into this special item number. So now when vendors go to submit their proposal to be listed under this special item number, they have to self-certify that they can meet our ERM, universal ERM requirements. Agencies, it's still, um, agencies still have to, to vet them on their own when they, they submit their um, request for a quotation, but it, they can at least see at that point, okay, these particular vendors said they can meet NARA's requirements for electronic messages, for example, or social media records. So um, we set this up about a year ago. Um, there are currently 46 vendors listed under the special item number. We've had a couple of industry days, two industry days, to promote this to agencies and to the vendor community, and we've seen a lot of interest from, obviously, from the vendor community, but also from agencies that are really um, interested in using this SIN, and we're starting to see that um, agencies start using this. The other good thing about this is that we can start to track um, how agencies are, what money they're spending on records management through this particular special item number, um, which we weren't able to do before that. So we can see exactly you know, what, what the spending is like, how much are agencies actually spending on electronic records management when they, they go out for these contracts. Another product that we came up with um, after setting up the SIN as part of our work with um, the Federal Integrated Business Framework are use cases. We've created use cases that agencies can use for specific record types that agencies can use to help them evaluate vendors. So it's like a standard document of the ideal workflow, for example, of how electronic messages um, should be managed. And it's a very detailed document, whereas the universal ERM requirements are very high level, this is a very detailed step-by-step -step how to manage an electronic um, message, for example. So we have a draft for electronic messages currently. Um, we also have a draft for website and social media records. Um, the electronic messages use cases, we've actually, we had an industry day on August 6th. We've asked vendors that are currently listed under Schedule 36 under the special item number for electronic records management. We've asked them to create demos based on our use cases. We selected three scenarios under the use cases and we've asked them to record demos and they'll be made available through GSA's discovery portal, which is a, um, not to be confused with e-discovery, it's a, um, it's an acquisition market research tool that agencies can access um, to help them when they're trying to make decisions about purchasing services and solutions. So um, they will actually post those demos on this website for agencies to see what's out there for electronic messages so they can see what kind of tools are out there, help them make their own decisions about what they can use to manage their electronic messages. And we've actually heard some really good feedback from vendors on this as well because they've said we know, now we know what agencies need when they're managing electronic messages. These are very clear requirements um, that we can work through with these use cases. So we're hoping to, de we're developing more. As I said, we have a draft for websites and social media as well. They have to be vetted by the Business Standards Council. Um, one of the other great benefits of being a standards lead on the Business Standards Council for Shared Services is that we provide input to the other standard leads standards as well. So we um, have been able to review use cases um, from the Treasury for financial management, 
and HR to make sure that electronic records management requirements are included. And that really eases the burden on records officers. They don't have to worry. If their agency goes to use these shared services, they don't have to worry about the records. I know um, from my own experience at an agency, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how are our records gonna be managed in this travel system, for example, that we were using as a shared service. So now um, agencies know that these records are being taken care of on a government-wide scale. Um, so that's really one of the benefits that we see in being a standard leads on, on the federal integrated business framework. So um, I think that's a good That's overview. great, that's great. <laughs> For now, um, I know it's a lot. <laughs> and uh, Jonathan, you're gonna be on deck. I do wanna get, uh, to make sure that the archivist question uh, to us is answered. It was a question from the floor. Uh, uh, Courtney mentioned social media. And, and websites, and Lawrence, Courtney, um, can you just uh, make clear for everyone here about uh, the federal record status of uh, social media and electronic messaging generally? Um, and you can also answer a FOIA question on that too, but why don't we start with federal records? So um, from a federal records perspective, and Alex and I were talking before the panel, um, so the answer is fairly easy, it's a yes. So in the Federal Records Act, uh, there are a few categories that are very clearly defined as far as what a record is and what a record isn't. It's a whole lot easier to say what it isn't, and that's generally stocks of publications, library and museum materials, um, copies of records maintained for purposes of reference. So everything else, if an agency uses it to conduct business, regardless of what it is or what format it's in, whether it's a text, a voice message, um, if it's used in the conduct of business, it's a record. And it, it always surprises me because I occasionally get mess questions from agencies like, well, we, we don't want to call any of our voice messages records. It's like, what are you thinking? Um, it's, you know, it's obviously a record. You use it to conduct business. So it's, um, it's at least fairly clear to us. Um, and of course, when it's not clear, we, we have lawyers who can help straighten things out for us. But. Yes, uh, uh, and I think there are FOIA implications for every form of electronic object, which is about government business. And so we can talk more about that. Jonathan, uh, so we are, we are in a world of difference for lawyers, especially after the rules changes in the federal rules of civil procedure in 2006. So tell us something about your practice of e-discovery and the kind of issues that you face with electronic evidence that uh, in part, you know, could relate to government records, but, um, you know, uh, have a slice of life discussion here about your, uh, your world that you manage uh, at Red Grave LLP. So a slice of life discussion, that's an interesting concept. I, I think I'll probably be a little bit broader, but maybe a little more focused if I can do both at the same time. I think what's happening in private practice of law is going to have a substantial effect on the practice of law period, including how it affects uh, federal agencies, um, state agencies, everyone else that's involved in the legal profession. And let me explain a little bit. There are a lot of concurrent factors. It's not just electronic evidence or computers, but um, the, the marketplace in the world is changing. So our law firm, we have a trademark tagline, information matters, and it's an entendre about we think information matters, and we also deal with everything that's a matter of about information. Where do you find it? How do you search it? How do you produce it? And things like that. And we look at our marketplace as very different than most firms think of product liability or they think of some toxic tort or something else. We've zeroed in on the CIOs and where the data is and what really matters, which is a very significant parallel when you think about record keeping in the federal government. It doesn't matter if it's DOL, DOD, EPA, you name it. It's where, where's the record? Where's the information about what this agency has done or does and what's the posterity and what falls within the Federal Records Act, right? So uh, from our perspective, we've seen the world differently than a lot of other firms. And I think where the market is gonna push is to changes like that. The business of law is gonna change tremendously with litigation funding. In the UK today, there is a placement um, public IPO of uh, the largest law firm to date raised like 95 million pounds as far as you know private investment in, in, in law firms. Uh, we don't have that here in the United States yet, but I think there's a tremendous push coming back for that. And what does that mean? Well, it means that I just told you earlier today about lawyers not being very innovative. 
Well, if other people are owners or investors in law firms, suddenly they're going to be pushed towards innovation. And technology and how it impacts information is a huge place where innovation is taking shape, whether you call it AI or anything else. And I think there, there's a lot that's going to happen there. Now, at the same time, another concurrent factor that's going on today is the reality of privacy finally awaking here in the United States. Whether you look at California with the CCPA, you look at all the efforts now that are starting to bubble up here on the federal level uh, to finally make privacy a greater priority. You certainly have more emphasis uh, among the lawyers suddenly waking up and saying GDPR, G, or U.S. clients could really be uh, affected by this. So there's a lot of things coming out with the privacy that then intersects with the pace of technology change, right? Everything's changing so fast, collaborative platforms, messaging platforms we haven't even thought of before. And then the great thing I think Jason has described differently, but just the massive amounts of data at any place, whether you're a private or a public sector. And the reality of an ocean of data, how far down in an ocean do you think you can actually see light? Does anyone know the answer to that? Jason, do you know how far down in the ocean you can actually see light? 200 meters. Then it disappears, okay? It kind of goes to a greenish gray light for a little bit. Uh, been at 1,000, you definitely see nothing, nothing. And your ocean can be as deep as 11,000 meters. Okay, what's the reality here? The more data we get, the less, I mean, it's funny. You think about sunlight being the best disinfectant and we need to get access to information. Well, then someone says you need to keep all the information. Well, wait a second. Suddenly there's an opacity that's created by keeping everything. And then this is where we get back to artificial intelligence, ways in which to search, which Jason and I have talked around the world on, and the reality that you really need to apply technology to help us find what really matters, to keep what really matters, so we can understand what really matters farther and farther into the future, whether it's for posterity, whether it's for a lawsuit. Um, this is really critically important. And these all intersect, by the way, with some fundamental truths. One of the reasons we have rules of evidence in our courts is to have fairness and have some understanding that the evidence coming in is authentic, it's genuine, it really means what it is purporting to mean. And all these artificial intelligence solutions create a quandary for the lawyers and the judges. And that is, how do we know it's true? How do we know that if we're using an algorithm to find things that didn't cheat, or someone didn't make it cheat, or it didn't fail, okay? It used to be we just trust people and have some measure of trust. We could sample or do something, and maybe that's part of the solution on the technology. But what's happening today is the lawyers are actually skeptical because they're just skeptical by nature. Law school makes us very jaded. Um, but the jading is actually kind of good because it makes you question. You really ask, what's going on? So what you're seeing now is this real tension between the potential of technology, which can be fantastic to help us find, look at relationships, understand data like never before, be able to make it so, so we can understand it years from now, maybe in different ways. Um, but we can get rid of things that don't matter, the clutter, the things that are actually going to cloud it. How do we actually make those decisions and determinations? This is really one of the most fundamental challenges from the legal perspective of how do you actually start making these decisions about how you clear out the information so you've got a clear body of water that you can search and you know you kept the right things, that your technology you applied didn't skew it. That's, that's not insignificant, right? Because if you keep the wrong stuff, you didn't keep the right stuff, it changes everything. And there may be no way back. So these are some of the things that I've you know just kind of mused about, we actually talk to our clients. We've got very large clients all around the world. They are actually concerned about this, not just from a legal compliance standpoint, but their role as a good actor in society. What do they want to do? Much like practically every person that works in the government, right? What do I do to do my job right? What do I need to keep? What do I need to make sure I'm doing to ensure that the agency record is the way it should be? So that the next person or the people that want to get us and see what we do through a FOIA request can know we did the right thing. It's great to say it, but how does this intersect with the technology? How does this really get us you know, to a point where the lawyers and a judge looking at one day will be able to look at, retrieve, and understand what we did? So these are some of the challenges, Jason, that quite frankly from the private practice of law, we're seeing our clients kind of fight with and tussle with and stuff that I've read, but you know, I know lawyers for the government also deal with. You and I have been part of a movement to educate lawyers about AI and about um, uh, using new advanced ways to search for information. Um, I will continue to be an advocate in the FOIA world for the FOIA officers in agencies to adopt, at least to think about adopting, um, advanced search techniques 
for going uh, to capstone repositories and to going through data sets that are very, very large, held by government agencies in response to FOIA. And in terms of records management, I know that we talked about mm -hmm. AI and transparency and about skill sets. So maybe we should orient in the few minutes we have left, the skill sets of the future, dealing with a world of AI that we know is there and coming, whether it's auto classification of record schedules or just uh, you know, any kind of AI function that government is part of. Uh, uh, sk talk a little, Lawrence, about a, a skill set of the future for records managers. What are your expectations? Right, so um, the conversation we just had in, before Jonathan started talking and in, in, in sort of the question about what is a record, within agencies by and large, it's not really the question they're asking. It's like, okay, we know what we got. Our problem is how do we capture it, how do we manage it, because of the issues that Jonathan was talking about, the, 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 the volume of data, the, the world that we live in, which is very uh, data-centric, very tech-driven, we, and it's critical that we, um, as a leader in records management at the archives, are successful with projects like Fermi, because one of the things that we want to do is actually not burden staff within agencies for the records management responsibilities in terms of what Jonathan was talking about. The only way it's going to get done effectively is if we use the tools like AI to make sure it's done effectively, building in or baking in the ERM requirements into processes where these records are, are created. So, you know, that, that is one of the things that we've been working on and it's actually a central part of the, the vision of our office within the office of the chief records officer where our goal is records management happens automatically, you know, with minimal end user intervention so that we use the technology that we have available to us and we know is ever improving to do the things that we know needs to be done so that agencies and their staff can focus on mission. We would all love to think that someday records management is going to be as important to uh, someone working in, in NASA as it is to putting people on the moon. But realistically, we're probably not going to get there. We can strive for that, but what we can do is try and, and drive what we have been successful doing so far in working with the vendor community to, to bake in requirements um, to, to make records management more effective and transparent to the user. So what does that mean for the records manager? I mean, I, I say that sometimes and they say, what are you doing? You're getting rid of my job. So we're not getting rid of your job. We're changing your job. There's still going to be a need for efficiency and effectiveness. There's still going to be a need for someone to advocate for evidence and accountability. But what we really need to see happen in the future, the, the, the skills of the records manager is one more of partnership and coalition building um, working as part of an information governance team. So what we recognize now, I mean, we, we now, since January of this year, have this chief data officer, we have chief, chief technology officers, we have CIOs, we have FOIA professionals. They're all part of that information ecosystem. The records manager and that, that community needs to be represented there on the same level, and that's, you know, going back to my earlier remarks, that's what we've been trying to do and elevate the profile of records management to get them at the table to be able to partner on these information management issues. So I think, you know, those are the kinds of skills that we want to see in the records managers of the future. We need to get them out of the basement. We need to get it at the table with the people who make decisions about information and advocate for the, the tools, the AI, the, um, the machine learning tools, not just for the mission work, but to support the mission work and make everything that we do in agencies more effective. If anyone has a question, go to the microphones. We'll keep going for a couple more minutes until Martha stops me. Um, and uh, let me say that I, the world is changing um, uh, and in lots of ways. Agencies have to adopt to the fact that we are a very mobile workforce. And um, the cohorts that are coming into government are going to have expectations about using the latest and greatest apps um, and technologies and not just rely on paper and not just rely on the past. There's a whole range of technologies that are out there um, that we have to consider. The Internet of Things will bring in all sorts of new data sources to government. Uh, blockchain records are going to emerge in the next decade as important in some government agencies. 
5G capability will make all sorts of um, connections imaginable and driverless cars and all sorts of um, ways uh, may change our lives. There'll be new types of records, DNA sequencing, uh, all sorts of things. Um, so we, we, uh, we can imagine a world of possibilities that uh, the records manager can have to expand their consciousness about what kind of records are being managed at, at various federal agencies. We have a question, yes. Besides storing records, NARA has the responsibility of making sure that the public will have access to the records. I work for the Air Force Declassification Office. One of our main responsibilities is to review records, paper records, and separate the classified from the unclassified. So we deliver the classified, separated into national security information and restricted data, formally restricted data, which NARA files away. And then there are the unclassified records that the public will have access to. Are you asking your vendors to make systems that will allow us to easily review electronic records and separate them such that the public will have access to the unclassified, but they won't be able to see the classified because those may be on the same server that the agency uses? So uh, I guess I'll jump in first. Um, You're the chief records officer, so yes. Yeah. Well, Courtney has a lot of experience with this working okay. for Fermi and the vendors, Either. but you know, sort of at a high level, I mean, what we do and what we see our role is establishing the requirements at you know, universal means that can be applied across the government. There's always going to be a need for agency-specific requirements, and certain agencies are going to need to adopt and establish differing requirements around national security that also need to be implemented in systems. So uh, the answer is we, we have to work with agencies to make sure that you know, the needs of the public and for that information are accounted for in our requirements. Otherwise, those systems don't get built, the vendors don't build them, and then there's nowhere for our agency customers to go to get the tools. So, so we, we have been concentrating on unclassified so far, but in the use cases that we've developed, we have um, a scenario focused on um, access, specifically focusing on FOIA, so that it's included, but we can, you know, we're still developing these use cases, we're still taking comments, um, we have, like I said, we have um, the website and social media that are being reviewed now um, that will go out for public comment, just like the electronic messages did on our blog, Records Express. So um, we will take comments and we can develop use cases that would address classified as well. And should that come from our records manager? Sure, or you can, and it could come from you too. We take them from everybody. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question here. Kind of, what is the role of records retention schedules at this point? It seems like this body of particularly electronically generated information just expands exponentially. And agencies, although they might have retention schedules that say certain records should be retired or destroyed, I, I think for the most part that's not happening. And so for in the FOIA context, you know, you may find, your agency may find itself in the position of having to do a search of this massive body of material, you know, maybe half of which shouldn't even exist under the records retention schedules at the point when you're doing the search. So what is your suggestion for agencies um, regarding records that are, you know, really shouldn't be there? So uh, we, we work with agencies to establish record schedules for the purposes of efficiency and effectiveness. So. They are mandatory, they're legal documents, and they need to be executed. Now, we know and we recognize, not just with schedules, but with a lot of other things, implementation is always a challenge within agencies. So it's much, I won't say it's easier, but it's a little bit more straightforward to establish the policy, but then getting all agencies in compliance with it is why we do oversight. So, um, I mean, the answer is really, I think one of education within an agency. Again, the, the various disciplines and customers and users within an agency need to understand the purpose of a record schedule, why it's there, why it needs to be implemented to make, to make it easier to find information and minimize risk. Because if the information is not required by law to be there, then it shouldn't, it shouldn't be there. So, that's part of the reason why I think the records officers and, and the, the records management community within agencies need to really 
take some time to figure out how to communicate the value of a record schedule and the value of disposition going forward because I don't think it's, it's readily understood and agencies are exposing themselves to risk unnecessarily because of that. Uh, we want to thank you. And I, my last word on this topic, I think we could go for hours on this, is that whatever the future of record keeping is, I really hope lawyers will not be uh, rendered extinct uh, in an age of automation. So I want to thank the panel and thank everybody. Thanks. Thank you, sir, You've certainly given us a lot to think about um, regarding the future of records management. So thank you again to all the panelists. And I will now turn things over to the archivist who will introduce our last distinguished guest. Is the archivist here? So thanks for sticking with us. You're in for a real treat. First, um, thanks to all of our speakers who provided great food for thought this afternoon on the future of electronic record keeping and uh, a reflection on the past, the present, and the future of OGIS. Hearing from all three branches of government today was particularly enlightening. Earlier, we had the pleasure of hearing from Senator John Cornyn of Texas. Now I would like to introduce Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont to close out our celebration of Sunshine Week. This will be the third time that Senator Leahy has joined us to mark Sunshine Week and I want to thank him and his staff for their support of this, uh, um, their support of, of this program. Senator Leahy has often mentioned that, has often mentioned that as a printer's son who grew up across the street from the Vermont State House, his interest in open government started early. He served for eight years as a state's attorney in Vermont's Chittenden, Chittenden County and was elected to the Senate in 1974, the same year that Congress passed its first amendments to FOIA. Senator Leahy ha has had a hand in every amendment to FOIA since 1976, 1986, 1996, 2002, 2007, and most recently with the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016. Ranking first in seniority in the Senate, Senator Leahy has been the chamber's leading champion of open government and of FOIA. In 1996, he was installed in the Freedom, Forums Institute, in Freedom Forum Institute's National FOIA Hall of Fame, and two years later was awarded the Zenger Award for Press Freedom, one of only two politicians to win the award since the University of Arizona began bestowing it in 1954. Senator Leahy is a leader on internet and technology issues and was the second senator to post a homepage. Among the issues he has championed are protection of privacy rights, copyright protections, and online freedom of speech. Senator Leahy is a long-standing member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, which he chaired from 2001 to 2003, and again from 2007 through 2014. During his chairmanship in 2002, he began working across the aisle with a freshman member of the, of the committee, Senator John Cornyn of Texas, on freedom of information issues. And that legacy of their partnership is reflected in the FOIA statute itself, for it is their work that helped ensure passage of the last three amendments to FOIA. Please help me welcome my friend, Senator Patrick Leahy. Thank you. I feel, <clears throat> thank you. I feel fortunate being here with David. He's done so much for this country. You know, the, I always worry that we seem to think that um, our country and our history is based on something we might have seen online briefly or a tweet of some sort. Our history and the history of a great country and a great democracy is here. And it also talks about the things that we've done right and things we've done wrong. Uh, it's all here. And when you have somebody like David who will have it there uh, honestly laid out, that's a treasure for us. Just as a treasure when we were 
just talk about being able to go in and seeing the treaty uh, from the Louisiana Purchase with Napoleon's signature <laughs> on it. These are not copies. These are real. And I think of the work uh, David, you, and the others do here at NARA. So NARA is our nation's historian. And therefore, our nation's mirror as we look to challenges ahead. We should always try to live up to the ideals of the founders, and sometimes we do. But NARA ensures we have the knowledge to learn from our mistakes, and we will make mistakes and have made mistakes, but learn from them so we can build also upon our successes. Such advancement and diffusion of knowledge. Remember James Madison said, I, my, James Madison was president my first term. Um, <laughs> he said that's the only guardian of true liberty. So we have Sunshine Week, thank goodness. Let's us reflect upon the fundamental principle that democracy is hidden from the people. There's no democracy at all. Just think about that. You hide the democracy, you hide what you're doing. That's not a democracy. Our government's lit legitimacy is based on the consent of the governed. But how can the governed know what to consent to if it's hidden from them? So this week, we push ourselves, the idea, the path toward a more perfect union requires us to lay bare and scrutinize our mistakes and our imperfections. You're not a perfect union by saying you're a perfect union if what you're doing is hiding your mistakes. From the beginning of my time in the Senate, 45 years ago, transparency has really been important to me. Maybe it's growing up in Vermont and growing up across the, from our state house where anybody could walk into anything and ask any questions. And then for 20 years as either chairman or ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I, I tried both to protect, and there were those who wanted to cut back the freedom of information. I wanted to protect it, I wanted to expand it. And you said we've had bipartisan help. I think of John Cornyn. Now, he and I are about as poles apart politically as anyone could be, but we both believe in the same thing. The government's doing something. We ought to know what the government is doing. It hasn't um, dwindled since I left as the top Democrat in judiciary to become the vice chairman of the Appropriations Committee. In the FY 2018 omnibus bill, which kept the government open, <clears throat> excuse me, enacted March of last year, I included a provision making congressional research reports available to the public. They had never been available to the public, but American taxpayers funded these reports. And they are excellent, but they are unavailable to the public. Now. We often use them to inform what legislation impacts our lives. Well, it shouldn't be just available to well-funded lobbyists through a subscription. Now they're available to all Americans. And I think that makes our government more accountable, certainly makes our Congress more accountable, but even more importantly, it makes the American people more knowledgeable. And in the 2019 Appropriations Minibus, I authored provisions instructing both the Departments of Homeland Security and Justice to apply FOIA requirements to private contractors. They were housing detainees and inmates. But it's our dollars they're paying for it. And because they're private doesn't mean we shouldn't be able to know what they're doing. We've had rampant abuses at private detention facilities and prisons. These have largely remained hidden from public view because they haven't been subject to federal transparency requirements. 
But these private contractors are engaged in fundamentally government operations. After all, they're holding American citizens locked up, and they shouldn't be given, shouldn't be able to escape scrutiny because of a blind spot in our laws. Our government should never operate in the shadows by proxy. And we'd be fooling ourselves if we failed to acknowledge the challenges facing FOIA in the months and years ahead. We had a recent audit of government-wide FOIA requests. The average processing time most agencies is hundreds of days longer than the 20-day that's established by law. There are a few pending FOIA requests that are decades old. And there are some agencies with tens of thousands of backlog FOIA requests. Now, one of the things I think Senator Cornyn and I have agreed on is that a lot of administrations, Republicans and Democrats alike, have had less than stellar track records of the FOIA. But let me be a little political here. The Trump administration gets the prize. They have demonstrated a particular aversion to transparency and to the truth. They have been the worst offenders. Just last week, I joined a bipartisan group of Congress members, including, not surprisingly, Senator Cornyn, who spoke here earlier today. We condemned the Department of Interior's recent proposed FOIA rule. Although Congress made it crystal clear that agencies cannot deny FOIA requests for reasons unrelated to the core interests protected by statutory exemption, their proposed rule would allow the agency to do precisely that. They had a list of bureaucratic justifications to deny uh, requests. Now, in the last two years, we've seen numerous examples where regional agency officers were ready to provide responsive records to FOIA requesters, but then they were overruled by political appointees to the agency's D.C. headquarters. We've seen agencies absurdly denying requests for very specific reports or for a very narrow set of uh, documents, but they said, well, they're overbroad. We've seen a proliferation of pro forma responses rejecting requests on grounds entirely uh, um, unrelated to the underlying request. A request will come in for here, a request will come in for here, entirely different things, pro forma objections raised. In one instance, you can't make this up. Uh, Raj did a lot of work in finding some of these. We found a draft report was withheld because the requester did not provide a date of birth or a death certificate for the subject of the request. This is stupid. This is balderdash. Such examples, I'll explain that word. Uh, <laughs> such examples, remember I'm older than you. Uh, such examples make a mockery of our nation's transparency law. I mean, can you imagine? It's almost like, what can we do to put up roadblocks here? Oh, I got a great idea. Do they have a death certificate for the person they're requesting information on? Come on. The list of transparency under the Trump, or the threats of transparency under the Trump administration goes on. It goes beyond FOIA. The president's ongoing opaque ties to his business organization makes it impossible to know whether foreign governments and corporations are able to curry favor with him by spending money on his business. The administration has issued an unprecedented number of a lobbyist waivers to its appointees, but they've done it in secret. They prevented the public from knowing whether Trump agency officials are simply continuing their advocacy on behalf of special interests in their official capacity. It's almost like they're a government onto their own. We had a cabinet member 
is finally forced out for conflicts of interest, who required his staff to raise the flag when he entered the building. It's not Buckingham Palace he's entering, it's his office. This was noted by Republicans and Democrats alike when we drove by on the way to John McCain's funeral. And every government office and a lot of private offices had their flags lowered to half staff, not this one, not this department. Until recently, there are serious concerns the Justice Department will conceal much of the special counsel's report from public view due to two separate internal DOJ policies. First, that a president should not be indicted while in office. And secondly, that unindicted individuals should not have their reputation solid by the department. Well, those are good on the face of it, but they shouldn't be used to hide presidential misconduct if that's what the special counsel finds. That'd be whether it's a special counsel for this president or special counsels and two former presidents. So I'm a lead co-sponsor of the Bipartisan Special Counsel Transparency Act. That would compel public disclosure of the report. And I'll support all efforts by both Republicans and Democrats to make that report available. So in conclusion, let me say the task of transparency is an uphill climb, but there's so many reasons to be hopeful. The American people have spoken for more transparency and accountability in our government. And I think Congress is suited to do just that. Just know your work is not done. Keep at it. Keep raising questions. We want the spotlight out there. We don't want it turned off. Some of us want to keep our hand on that switch and keep the light on. But we want to know where to shine it. So don't hesitate. Don't hesitate calling, writing us, talking to us. You know every well-paid lobbyist will. Well, let's make sure the American people do. Thank you very much. And David, thank you for the opportunity. Okay? Out this way? Okay. Thank you. We have a vote on in a few minutes. I've, I've got to go back. I don't uh, want you to have to file a Freedom of Information Act to see if I got a speeding ticket on the way back. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Leahy. That was, that was really a pleasure to have him here and, and speak to us today. Um, I know we're all kind of eager to get going. Um, I think we actually stuck to our schedule, so I'm very proud of that. Um, thank you to everyone who participated in our event today for being here in person or watching us uh, remotely. Um, I want to give a special thank you to my absolutely amazing OGIS staff, who was absolutely instrumental in planning and executing this great afternoon. I couldn't have done it without them. Um, a special thanks to um, Special Assistant to the Archivist, Maureen McDonald, and to John Hamilton and Sean Wharton, our Director and Deputy Director of Congressional Affairs. Uh, also, special shout out to our special events and AV staffs. You guys are always do a great job of keeping things running, so thank you. If you would like to learn more about the work that OGIS does, please um, read our annual report. It is now available online at www.archives.gov backslash OGIS. Uh, we have included a brief summary in the handout that was available. Uh, please read our blog the FOIA Ombudsman, and follow us on our Twitter handle at FOIA underscore Ombuds. Thank you again for joining us for Sunshine Week celebration, and we hope you will join us again next year. Bye, everyone. Thank you.